Assalamu alaikum, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today we're honored to speak to Mufti Liaqat Zaman. Assalamu alaikum, Mufti. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam, brother. Mashallah. Zakhla khair, brother Bassam. We welcome. Mufti Liaqat Zaman completed his school and college education before moving to Pakistan at the age of 18 with an intention to seek sacred knowledge. He memorized the Quran before joining the Alamiya course at Jamia Ulum al Islamiya in Banori town where Mufti Liaqat Zaman dedicated the next eight years of his life. Upon graduation in 2008, Mufti Liaqat decided to further develop his passion and ability in fiqh and enrolled onto the Iftat course at Jamia Tayyibah in Karachi, Pakistan, where he obtained an ijaza in Iftat. Having returned to the UK since, Mufti Liaqat has been delivering lectures, khutbas, and courses for a number of years and has become a well-known figure in the community. His desire to reconnect all Muslims, especially the youth, with the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah led him to begin his YouTube channel, Roots of Knowledge, whose link is shared in the description box below, and Anchor Podcast as a means of bridging the disconnect between the public and the scholars. Today, Mufti Liaqat is going to give us an introduction to Arabic literature, and we'll also be discussing the controversial figure of Taha Hussein, whereby Mufti Liaqat will introduce us to who he is and critically assess some of the controversial remarks he made concerning the, uh, concerning the Arabic language and, by necessary extension, the Qur'an. Mufti, whenever you're free, the floor is all yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alayhi wa sallam ajma'in. I apologize for my voice. Uh, and inshallah, I'll try to make it as uh, easy to understand as possible. So Arabic uh, literature or Arabic jahili poetry um, and Taha Hussein. Now, first of all, um, the individual Taha Hussein, uh, I actually came across him, I think it was probably 2014, maybe maybe 2013. I came across him and uh, I, I I actually started to read um, a lot about him. Before that, I heard about him um, here and there, but I wasn't really too interested in um, what he had written or the impact his writing had on uh, many individual thinkers uh, at his time and later on. And the first time I actually started interest, showing interest in his works was um, when I started to read um, Al-Mutanabbi. By uh, Sheikh Mahmoud uh, Muhammad, uh, Sheikh Mah- Muhammad uh, Shakir, so Mahmoud Muhammad Shakir, who is the brother of Sheikh Ahmed Muhammad Shakir, uh, two famous, well-known uh, scholars uh, that were residing in in Egypt. Um, I was very familiar with the writings of Ahmed Shakir um, from before, but Mahmoud Shakir was someone I actually started to learn about a lot later on. Um, so the story actually goes back to when I was studying in Madrasa where uh, one of my friends, he actually, one day we were sitting down and he actually mentioned to me about Mahmoud Shakir. He said, Mahmoud Shakir uh, dedicated 10 years of his life to studying everything he could about the um, Arabic language, uh, Jahili poetry and everything that comes with that. And I was intrigued because I wasn't really familiar with uh, too many uh, names uh, from the uh, Jahili poets. So, um, so I started to look into this, and, I, and when I began to read the introduction of Al Mutanabbi by uh, Mahmoud, uh, Mahmoud Shakir, uh, Mahmoud Ahmad Shakir, um, clearly he he dedicates 125 or so pages to um, his teacher Taha Hussein, right, the discussions that he had with Taha Hussein, and um, <clears throat> it's a kind of like a it's almost you can say like a journey he takes you on. Right from the start when he began his studies with uh, Taha Hussein, and then later on how things developed and his uh, his almost you can say uh, uh, dislike for the approach that Taha Hussein was adopting, and even um, uh, dislike of Taha Hussein for him to a degree. Uh, but this kept him going. Alhamdulillah, I mean he he managed to uh, produce uh, quite a lot of books. Uh, that was a result of this initial inquiry that he started. So, so first of all, let's start off, uh, and then inshallah, I'll mention about uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Shakir, inshallah. So, first of all, um, what we have to, I think, understand just for 
general public or people watching who are not familiar with uh, Arabic literature. Um, I remember my mom, uh, because I'm obviously non-Arab, and my mom used to say to me that, what do you guys study in madrasa? You know, don't you guys just study the Quran and study how to give talks and study uh, du'as? Isn't that what you guys do? So I said, no, it's not It's not as black and white as that. We do study those things, but we also have to study other sciences that are related to that. And this is where Arabic literature is very, very important, I personally think, for anyone that really wants to um, fully uh, delve into the science of tafsir studies, especially when it comes to understanding Qur'an, Quran, um, and then you know everything that sort of uh, follows on from that. So Arabic literature, language, uh, is very important for Muslims, um, and specifically the Arabic that existed in the time of the, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. And the reason for that was because um, Arabic language has, like any other language, uh, gone through um, evolution, right? So it's been affected by um, wars, it's been affected by foreign um, nations, Persians, Romans, even Africa. Um, and so you can see inside the Arabic language that the Arabic language has developed a lot um, even before the Quran was revealed. Um, so when the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the amazing things about this um, this language that the Quran came in was that the um, um, the Quran was it unified the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, <clears throat> I mean, my background is I am uh, originally from uh, Pakistan. So my grandfather came from Pakistan to the UK, and we're from a uh, Pashtun background, right? So our language is Pashto, and Pashto is very similar to the construct of how Arabic used to work in the olden days, um, where you have tribes, Qabail, uh, scattered throughout this mountainous era, area. And uh, the languages, the dialects, the pronunciation of certain words even, they differ a lot. So you could go to the south of this sort of like diaspora, and you can go to the north, and you can say the same sentence, or you can hear the same sentence, but you probably will find pronunciation different or maybe even uh, certain sequencing of wordings, you'll find it different as well. And that made me more intrigued and uh, interested in learning about my own language as well. So what was happening in the Arabs was because their languages, you had like in the north, you had Arabs that were living in the north um, that were, th there's a word that is used for them, which is uh, al-ba'ida, the Arab al-ba'ida which was almost like you can say the remnants of the people of Thamud, the people of Ba'ad. And these are the people whose uh, later generations possibly um, were influenced by the Romans. So you had these Arabs that were living on the border around, um, you know, today's Levant. And their language, the Arabic that they used to speak was an Arabic that was, um, that was a bit different or written even a bit different because of the usage of certain Roman words as well. Um, than the south. So the south was Yemen, uh, Oman, in today's Yemen, today's Oman. And they were uh, influenced by a lot of trade as well. So trade that was coming through, um, you know, the ports, uh, through the Indian Ocean. And then you had Africa there as well. So you had a lot of uh, words that came from Abyssinia and these areas. So their language is a bit different as well. Um, and you had, then you had the Arabs that were, you can almost say, divided into these two categories, known as those that came from the progeny of uh, the Qahtaniyin, so the Qahtan Arabs, who were considered to be, you can almost say, like the earliest existing Arabs um, from whenever that was. And then you had the Adanani Arabs. Adanani Arabs goes back to Adanan, who is from the progeny of our uh, you know, Prophet uh, Ismail alayhi salam as well. Ismail alayhi salam's progeny, you know, they moved to Mecca and then they developed. They say Ismail alayhi salam was the first to um, to to speak the Arabic language. And then that sort of like slowly began to develop over the years. So <clears throat> slowly what began to happen was Mecca now became almost like the center of the Arabian Peninsula. People from all around were slowly visiting Mecca on a regular basis, on a yearly basis, in fact. And there seemed to be this official, you can say, Arabic that was used by people. So just like, you know, some of the, some of the, the writers have written Historians have written, just like you have, for instance, in some countries, like in Arab countries today, you have this official, you know, modern standard Arabic that's used 
at the government level, uh, newspapers are written and, you know, news speak they use that specific sort of like language and then you have amongst the people you have various dialects but everyone almost can understand each other and they can understand the official language so this is what was happening over there the writing as well was being developed as well clearly the writing had come from uh they say normally language first of all starts off spoken and then writing is developed later on so most likely that's what's happened to the arabs their writing had been developed from an earlier um, an earlier sort of a civilization of Arabs. And um, I mean, this was something I, I read, uh, I think I probably read it about 10 years ago. And this was written by Sheikh uh, Abdullah bin Baya in his book, uh, uh, I think it's called Amali al Majali or Majali al Ali, if I'm not mistaken. In there, he discusses about uh, a discussion between many early Arabs regarding what was the first language spoken by Adam alayhi salam. Was it Arabic or was, was it some? other language that was you can almost say like the seed of arabic so when adam alayhi salam his offspring spoke maybe they spoke a language that was going to be the the mother of all languages and then all languages around the world uh was an offshoot of that allah knows best but going back to what we were saying so 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 the arabs began to devise their own system of of language so much so that some of the arabs are recorded to have saying that Arabs that were living in the north, their language was a different language from the Arabs that were living in the south of Arabian Peninsula. That like you can almost say two different languages. But um, what does that actually mean? So when people say their language is different, what does that exactly mean? Is it like when we say uh, how Welsh people speak and Scottish people speak compared to how English people speak? Is it that kind of difference where you would say they speak a different language? And the means of communication between them was very isolated. It was it, it wasn't regular. So like their own words and phrases would develop in a different way. So this is another thing we're going to talk about when we discuss Taha Hussein. I just want to keep that in the back of your mind. They began to develop different ways of expressing themselves, just like every society around the world. Poetry seems to be something which is ingrained in human beings. You can almost say it's like a it's like a melodious way of people expressing themselves and passing on stories. Um, and it's very catchy, so it's it's memorable. Poetry was a key aspect of Arabian Peninsula. In fact, um, um, this is something that I was actually... Um, uh, I heard uh, someone actually say this, and it actually clicked with me, which was, um, when you live in Western society, Western society, they don't have too much um, sort of like... Uh, cult culture isn't, too, uh, isn't based a lot on, around poems um whereas for example arab culture um you know they, they love poetry or maybe even not necessarily poetry as understood in the past but rhyming sentences rhyming phrases um proverbs these kind of things and it's very catchy the way they say things in fact there's like books that are dedicated to amthal arab right arabs will have like a saying that's kind of catchy um like uh qila wa qala uh, you know uh, 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 these kind of statements, and the same goes in Asian, uh, the Asian sub in uh, Southern Asian subcontinent as well. You have in Urdu, you have in in, in Pashto, my language as well. You have a lot of this as well. So Arabs, <clears throat> they were you could almost say they were, the, the, uh, uh, poetry in them days was almost like uh, their media outlet. It was something which people used to um, use as a way of trying to. Um, inform people of what's happened in the society, um, honoring, well, this happened later on, leaders, like especially in the time of Mutanabbi and others, um, when leaders would deliberately uh, call a, um, a poet to write for them, um, you know, a qasida, a whole list of couplets uh, to praise them, right? Because that was going to now be going to become, you can almost say like the front page of the news, right? If a poet, if a poet has said something about you, that's the front page, People are going to hear it. It's going to spread. So it was a very powerful means of getting your message across through poems. In fact, <clears throat> poetry in the time of the Muslims, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, there was a lot of restrictions that were that were laid down by Umar, anhu, or you can say policies uh, with regards to poetry as well. Um, Umar, anhu, when he came to Medina once, he saw some youngsters and they were shooting arrows and one of them missed the, the, the target. And he said a statement which was uh, which was incorrect. And then Umar got angry at him, um, and he said he said to him that 
you know, uh, your mistake in shooting the target is is less painful to me than the mistake of your tongue. Um, so Umar radiallahu anhu, he decided to establish um, that every single teacher in Medina has to know Arabic poetry. So that shows Umar radiallahu concern. The he he developed a place called the Butayha, which was like an um, an area ad adjacent to Masjid Nabawi. I'm not too sure exactly which part of Masjid Nabawi is today, but there was an adjacent area that he 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 set up and said anyone that wants to recite any poetry from now on, start reading it, start reciting it over there. No longer can you do it in the Masjid. So it shows before uh, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, there was a culture of poetry in the Masjid. And that stemmed from the time of the Prophet Sallam, Hassan bin Thabit, and others who 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 you know are recorded in the books of Sirah as well. So poetry, you know, was was widespread. I, but again, um, poetry was different because the the genre was different as well. People would have their own types of poetry. A lot of what has reached us today is only a fragment. You can almost say there's only a, a select amount of poems that have actually reached us from what really existed in the olden days, uh, because they seemed maybe it was because. There wasn't a centralized um, government and they didn't uh, consider um, organizing all the poetry like, for instance, how the science of hadith later on was was brought all together in that way. There was also non-prose as well. So a lot of sort of like there was this thing called the uh, kahana. So soothsayers would go around, you know, like, um, um, you know, abracadabra, uh, mumbo jumbo, these kind of. Phrases they used to come out with these kind of catchy, catchy statements um, to predict the future, um, or even like come out with some some strange, so like um, um, I don't know, communication with jinn maybe because that's another interesting thing, which was the poems of jinn as well. So the Arabs they used to believe in the idea that jinn, the jinn used to um, inspire them to come out with poetry, right? So that's that, that was another thing Arabs had. So non prose, so you had you had this kahana, right? Kahana was there, and then you also had khitaba. So khitaba was basically you had individuals that were very eloquent in the way that they were able to express themselves, and they would speak. Um, and uh, the Prophet sallam, about them, he even mentioned. He said in the in the min al bayani, la that there are many types of expressions that people uh, that people. Uh, articulate where it's almost like like sorcery it's almost you can say uh like dazzling right it can put a person under like a spell almost it can make them cry it can make them laugh all it is is a person using the right words at the right time in the right sequence so there was this as well so arabic language it's you can almost say there's there was a rich culture of language um today you know, in English society, we probably don't have that amongst ourselves. Um, you know, just looking at the types of music that people make, the lyrics that people come out with, um, it's very, very limited to the amount of words they use, the expressions they use. But the Arabs, the expressions that they were used was quite vast compared to in today's times. So it was rich in culture as well, because um, in order for, like, this is my own experience when I was uh, studying the Arabic language. Um, I found it very difficult to understand certain certain statements. Um, I remember once I had a breakup with one of my friends. Uh, he wouldn't. He, he didn't speak to me for a few days. And the story was this: uh, What happened was uh, I was uh, eating, and uh, he came in the room, where, where, you know, in our dorms, and he said to me, uh, he he just looked at me, and I said to him, um, "This is this is my like this is my attempt to translate what I understood in English, you say, into Arabic." So I said to him, uh, to read and ta'akul ma'i. So he looked at me, he turned his face and walked out. So <laughs> I thought, you know, maybe maybe something's happened at home, maybe because maybe sometimes students would get bad news from home. They'd be upset for a few days. I said, let, let him cool down. Three days went by and the guy's not coming to the room when I'm when I'm there and he's not talking to me. Eventually, after three days, he comes to me and then he doesn't even speak to me. And then he goes to me, passes me a note he's written. And I read it, I got, and it's, it's a long incident. Basically, what happened was, he said to me, you know, when you invited me for the food, why did you say to me to read and ta'kul? You should have said, kul, kul ma'i. Yeah, sigh amr. That's how yeah. we say it. Yeah. So I apologized, and I said to him, I said, look, Afwan, I didn't understand this is your culture. Like, I'm, I'm learning the culture. 
So in our culture, we say to people, would you like to come to this event? So anyway, so this is my sort of like, uh, you know, my, my learning curve, you can almost say, in understanding culture. And Arabic poetry is filled with this kind of stuff, right? You know, there's certain words in Arabic poetry or even Arabic language itself where you have to be careful of how you use it as well. Like, waylaka, waihaka. Like I, was, I, I wasn't sure when to use waylaka and when to use waihaka. How, how are these things used? Even things like jokes in Arabic as well. Um, like... There's a different way of how a joke is understood in the West, um, you know, especially for a child, uh, you know, someone that's brought up in the 80s and 90s, uh, compared to someone who's brought up um, uh, today's times as well. The jokes are very different. The style is different. Yeah. The Arabs, they've got a different way of. So anyway, so so language use is very, very important as well. Um, so the growth of Arabic writing is also something very important as well. When you study the Arabic language, you can't just study, for example, Imr al-Qais, right? If you study Imr al-Qais, uh, you know, ala an im sabahan or, um, you know, qifa nabqi, you can't, it's, it's simply just a matter of understanding the translation. You can't fully grasp it until you understand jahiliya, how jahiliya worked in them days. What is jahiliya? And this is another thing that I got really interested in. And um, it was trying to understand the history of pre-Islamic era. So once I was invited to uh, give a lecture or a little small little talk for um, the Islamic ISOC in the university in our city, Birmingham. And it's for the medical students. They wanted to understand about um, Islam and, and medicine and Dibbun Nabui and, and these, these issues. So I began reading a lot about uh, Jahiliya. And uh, from there, I came across a few books. One of the books was called um, Al-Mufassal Fi Tariqh Al-Arab uh, Al-Jahili. Uh, by Ali Jawad and this is a very a very big book it was very detailed and I came across a lot of <clears throat> sort of very interesting things of how Arabs used to do things especially when it came to sort of like um, Arabic poetry you would never find an Arab poet who would praise his wife in poetry you just don't find it they don't describe their wives in their poetry the, you know the shape of their body or their hair or this or that but the Arab poets would always talk about this fictitious lady yeah, a fictitious lady in poetry, you always find it. That was, again, something new for me as well, especially like um, being brought up. Um, and, and, you know, when I started practicing, understanding that there's limitations between interaction between men and women from an Islamic point of view. And then you've got this poetry that you got to learn. And it's talking about this woman's hair and her cheeks and this and that. You're thinking, is this right, right for me to study? But I had to learn that in order for me to understand the mindset of the Arabs in them days, how these work. So um, you had, so I had to, you know, learn about Arabic jah Jahili poetry, the different types of Jahili poets as well. Uh, those kind of like um, r romantic kind of ones, uh, Ghazal, right, Imr al Qais style poems. And then you have like the Antara kind of warriors, fighters. And then, you know, later on into the Islamic poets as well, the ones that praise the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then slowly as you move on, the ones that slowly start praising um, leaders. And, and then you get this kind of almost, you can say, um, this like racism superiority complex some poets had with each other um, and then slowly it starts to develop into different even till today like our poets their, their, their poetry is different from the past and then you had um, Nathar as well Nathar was was more like a non-prose so the non-prose was you had to we had to learn about things we had to learn this strange kind of maqamat al-hariri it was like we had to there's 50 maqamat al-hariri uh, maqamats which is basically uh, like these dramas that take place and they're always between these two uh, uh, fictional characters yeah um, and these two fictional characters one is like this charlatan and he's always trying to get money somehow from people and no one knows who's he, who he is and then there's one other character who always kind of finds out about him right and then the story ends by each of them exposing each other um, so you know that was another interesting genre as well that we covered the maqamat genre which was clearly a, you know a, a newly developed um, a genre by the Arabs, and then you had as time by you had genres like um, novels as well that came came about. <clears throat> so writing these kind of like novels styles, and then in today's times as well you have many. So studying all of that is very very important for any uh, student of knowledge. I would say. Now the significance of a poet, <clears throat> I think historically would differ from place to place. Today's times, I'm I'm, I'm not too sure, maybe brother. Uh, 
Uh, but Sam, you're probably much more familiar with that. Uh, but poets in today's times, to me, doesn't really have any significance um, f- from a political point of view or from, you can almost say, like shaping the minds of people. Uh, pr- it probably in today's times, it's it's slightly, uh, slightly more than a singer of today's times. The lyrics of a song of today, maybe. It might be the same, I don't know. But in the past, the poets uh, played a, a very, you know, uh, pivotal role in <clears throat> in uh, shaping the 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 name or the status of their um, tribe. Very very important, right? You, you know, you had to have a poet in your society that would, you know, stand up for you, that would defend you from from another, you know, do hajj, uh, attack others as well in their poetry as well. And um, we see this in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he would uh, tell Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu anhu to you know uh, to stand up and, and and speak against the Quraysh because this shaped the minds of the Muslims. It got them prepared for you know the onslaught that they were they were doing against the Muslims. And likewise, the Arabs had their own. <clears throat> so I think in them days, poets played a very very important role, and that's why maybe this is something that some of the scholars say. Maybe that's why when the Quran was revealed, you see the poets are the first people that the people rushed to to try and figure out that is this really from from a divine source is it really from Allah is it really from God and um, there were like certain individuals like Walid and Mughira who, who who made his famous statement that you know the Quran cannot be from humans it's like a tree and it's filled it's embellished with these beautiful leaves and its branches are so far reaching and it's like this and this and this eventually he just said well it has to be magic it has to be sihr it divides between people so even the poets of them days were unable to challenge the Quran as well. So <clears throat> the the continuation of poetry throughout generations, like I said, is something also we see. Um, but I think later on, it's not important for us to study poetry as much it were, as it as it was in the early years. Now, one of the things that Dah um, Hussein is going to really kind of uh, focus on is um, the chains of poetry. So. Chains of poetry is almost like the science of hadith tradition, hadith transmission rather, mm-hmm. where the Prophet ﷺ has said many statements, has done many actions. And then how do we know he said them and how do we know he did them? So what happens is we have a system where people would actually inquire, where did you get this information from? Who did you hear? And they 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 they, they created this whole database over the years, almost half a million uh, narrators of of hadith from the most reliable to the most uh, fabric the most the most fabricating ones this whole database that scholars have, have compiled and this in itself is an amazing feat this is because it actually shows how imp- how much importance the muslims gave to reports themselves to information uh, that goes back to our our religion poetry um poetry didn't have the same you can say status as hadith and that's clearly we understand the reason because poetry started before islam and uh, also poetry is more like something which is uh, like stories yeah so stories are also something that have been passed down um for the years but the 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 degree of strictness that you have to adhere to when you're telling a story that's not related to quran directly to quran or to hadith uh, is okay, uh, and we get this from narrations where Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, uh, uh, they they came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they said, uh, you know, the Jews of Medina are explaining their books to us in Arabic. Is it okay if we if we sit with them? And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, um, it's fine. Uh, narrate from them. Listen to them if you want. Narrate from them. La haraj. But he says, whatever they say that contradicts our religion, do not accept it. And if it doesn't co- contradict our religion, uh, then Say, uh, yeah, so we don't, we don't believe in it and we don't reject it, uh, rather, we believe in what Allah has said. Right? So, it's very important for a Muslim to understand where he puts everything basically. So, poetry, I seen as though it went through that as well, but there were clearly people who understood poetry because it was you can almost say it was a poet, a, a, a poetic you can say society arabs were poetic people they were the men were poetic the women were poetic is it ran in their veins you can almost say you didn't have to be like you know you didn't have to have qualifications to be a poet it was just something which naturally came to some people so that's why the the passing down of the poetry 
was something that could not be denied. It was clearly passed down. <clears throat> but there were certain individuals who clearly were what we call rawiyas. Yeah, rawiya would be like you can almost say like a transmitter, like a narrator of a of a poem. That were people who were famous individuals historically who became well known for. But it doesn't mean that the whole of the 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 database of poems that the Arabs passed down uh, had to go through those individuals. No, right? It, it clearly was passed down through through many ways. So this is a little bit about Arabic literature. I thought I'd mention, um, uh, and um, you know, just just to kind of give an understanding to the to the general people out there, and and if people ask ask me a lot about, um, do I need to study? Do I need to? Do I really need to learn Arabic poetry? Can I not just understand the Arabic of the Quran through Arabic? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a strange question, uh, and the the strange answer I'm probably going to give is, uh, no, you can't. Um, uh, how why is it that you can't understand it through Arabic? The reason is because if you're if you understand something through Arabic, then you're probably understanding it through a dictionary. And those dictionaries have been um compiled, written by scholars throughout history. And those dictionaries are, you can almost say, like our access points uh to Arabic literature of the past. It's basically this guy, you've got this guy who like Ibn Mandur, Lisan al Arab, who's sitting there who's compiled from a whole range of various books and and he is collecting and he's giving you access to to all of this information of Arabic literature of the past in a beautiful way, uh, letter by letter or whatever order he that he's ordered in. So that's why if you really want to, I would say, if you want to understand the Quran where you can translate each word and you can see the Arabic, then by all means, you know, just stick to a dictionary. But if you want to be able to understand the Arabic where you don't need anyone else's help, but right, you don't need no one else's help at all, then you have to be able to understand it from where the dictionaries got their information from, right? Which is all the way going back to the original sources. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, next. So the second thing that I think is very important to understand here is now for, for Muslims, uh, especially, is the, the Quran. All of us know as Muslims, alhamdulillah, that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something which is uh, Allah himself has guaranteed protection of his words. Yeah, inna dhikra wa inna lahu Allah says, this protection that Allah has guaranteed for the Quran is something which obviously is going to be done through human individuals. And Allah himself, he... Uh, you know, he, he he creates people, he he selects people for the khidmah of his deen. Preservation of his deen is done through Allah's selection. We always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to become, um, you know, a piece in that whole big project um, of, 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 of uh, preservation of the Quran, you can almost say. Allah is the guarantee of this will continue till the day of judgment. But we want to be part of that so we can protect it. And protection doesn't just mean you learn it and then you pass it on. No, protection also means what we're doing here as well. We're critiquing individuals like Taha Hussein, right? Because protection also means that any sort of like confusion that can come from external sources, we have to also try and uh, test those, check those. What are they saying? Is there any validity in that statement? And how is this going to affect the, the Quran? Taha Hussein, <clears throat> when we talk about Taha Hussein, Taha Hussein was just one individual in the many individuals uh, who were slowly, um, you can almost say, um, critiquing the Quran itself, right? who were actually, who believed in themselves, Allah knows best to what degree, who believed in themselves that the Quran was tampered with, right? and that the Quran, they were, it was basically like, you can almost say, the New Testament. It was filled with, you know, a whole, you know, three or four generations of, of editions or, um, or revisions um, and this is why we have to believe that the Quran that was sent to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran that we have today this is the pres preserved Quran the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left us when he left this dunya so when he left this dunya um, this was the Quran that we have today is that so this is why miracle and the mu'jiz of the Quran the scholars have written extensively about this um, I don't want to go into this too much um, but um, mu'jiza is a, is, a, is, is a newly used word. Uh, the Quran doesn't mention the word mu'jiza for this term miracle, right? And I personally don't like using the word miracle because it seems very Christian. 
Um, the word that the like Imam um, um, in Al Fikr Akbar, a book that's attributed to Imam Hanifa or some of his students, it mentions the word Al Bayinat. Al Bayinat is a better word. Right, that the Quran is a bayinat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a clear proof from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a hujjah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran clearly mentions to, to, to everyone, even the non-Muslims and even the jinn, that whoever has doubt that this Quran is from Allah, then bring one chapter like it. How do, how do we test this? This is obviously requires us to understand the Arabic language. Right? You would have to understand how the Arabic language developed and it... There are like so many different uh, variables and, and, and factors to take into consideration before thinking how I can challenge the Quran. Um, seriously, it's a very vast topic this is. <clears throat> but for us, we're going to be focusing on the Arabic language itself. And the Arabic language is preservation um, of how the Quran has been preserved for this mu'jiza to, to last till today as well is an amazing is a thing as well. Um, I remember... You know, um, Al Imam Abu Bakr Bakilani, scholar in the 400s, who wrote uh, Ijaz al Quran. And uh, this is also something which, uh, on a similar topic, the Muqaddimah of, uh, of a similar book, Sheikh Mahmoud uh, Shakir, he actually writes against Taha Hussein and he mentions about the the clear sort of like uh, arguments that the, these individuals like Taha Hussein were bringing because. Their basis was the Quran is not something which is miraculous. It's not something which is a mu'jizah. Mm. Right? It's something which anyone can really develop. And clearly, it was insp they believe it's inspired by God, but it can change over time. Right? Its application can change. Mm. So this is why, um, if you kind of think about this, there's nothing really, if, if, if we take away that the Quran is something that is immutable, is something that cannot be challenged, if you take that out, out of the equation, then it's... Islam really has nothing else for the non-Muslim to be able to prove that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very powerful like point this is that Allah makes in the Quran. And I remember reading this in uh, Imam Salakhsi in his book, um, Usul al-Salakhsi. He's got a, a section, a chapter, where he talks about the hujjaj al-shari'i, sharia. So he talks about this and he says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send, sends a prophet, he says, what... Uh, it's always possible that a charlatan can appear and claim to the people that they also are prophets as well. Right? And historically, people have done this. And the Prophet ﷺ himself warned, there's going to be 30 um, charlatans that will appear claiming that they are prophets. And then Imam Salaqsi says that for the, the, the statement or the claims that the Prophet comes with, for them to be accepted, he has to come with mu'jizat, mu things that will... Um, that will incapacitate anyone at their time from being able to challenge it. Right? They are incapacitated by that. What does this incapacity mean? And this was something interesting I actually found um, when I read more about this. Um, and it was actually, this is another another reason why I was reading. Uh, there's a book called al Nubuwat in two volumes by um, Al-Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. Um, so someone asked me this question about, there was a particular individual who's been claiming that the sun rising from the West in the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that before the end of time, the sun will rise from the West. Um, he said, that, this particular individual said that this is actually the West. A time is going to come when power will shift from the East to the West and, you know, political strength and, you know, military, military strength and economic strength is going gonna, is gonna to be in the West, basically. So it's a metaphor. So I, I read up about this and... Um, and there was two books that I really, really benefited from, um, from, from because of that uh, little investigation that I did. One was a, a book by Mustafa Sabri. So Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, the late uh, famous uh, Mufti of, uh, uh, Wakil Mufti of uh, the Ottomans uh, before, you know, the secularization. Yeah. And this is called Mawqif uh, al-Aqli wa Deen. Uh, it's a four-volume book. I didn't read it. It was just uh, chapters I read. And, you know, that was the first time when I realized, you know, subhanAllah, you know, someone where you kind of like think that they are very traditional has such a vast understanding of Orientalism mm. and the sciences. Like it, it amazed me how much Mustafa Sabri had actually looked into this whole idea of mu'jizah, i'jaz. 
Um, so that was the first time I kind of realized um, a very important sort of like point, which I'm going to mention later that Sheikh Abdurrahman al Badawi mentions, uh, if I remember, inshallah. Um, I'll mention it now, then I'll, I'll mention it later on, which is Taha Hussein. He says this in his uh, his book, Dirasat Hawla Hawla Mushtashtiqin, Dirasat al Mushtashtiqin Hawla Shi'r al Jahili. He says, Abdurrahman al Badawi, he says, he says the strange thing is he says the traditional scholars they only they only uh, uh, rose to to combat Taha Hussein's arguments when Taha Hussein made them. Yet these same arguments were being made by other individuals, uh, Orientalists, way before him. Mm. Yeah, you know, sixty years before him, um, they were made by them. But he says if only the Muslims, you know. Uh, clicked on, yeah. They, they realized this years before and had already made prep plans and preparation to combat this. And I think that's a very important thing for us in in any time, which is we learn from the mistakes that we made in the past. And any new challenges Muslims are going to face, we don't wait until a um, a sort of a, you can almost say enlightened, you know, individual claiming that they're Muslim comes around and says, "Look, I believe this," and starts propagating it. And then all of a sudden we start writing articles and books against that. We need to have like a, a preemptive sort of like approach to this as well. Yeah, Understand well, what's going to happen. We need we need to we need to contain intellectual threats as they emerge. You know, but uh, I think contain. a lot of people, a lot of people hesitate because sometimes there's a shubha, there's a doubt, and when you ask certain apologists or duaat or imams or shiuch to you know try to refute it, they'll say, "Well, this this shubha is still not known. If we refute it." We will popularize it, but you know, the, yeah. uh, you you need to. You, we need to act proportionally here. Okay, so if the shubha is not popular, you you don't have to popularize your response, but at least have it prepared. You know, you could you could publish it quietly uh, on your blog. You don't mm -hmm. have to make noise about it, but at least you've done the research mm -hmm. and is prepared so that if a Muslim does get exposed to this argument um, and he gets confused, he should at least be in a situation where he could search for the answer and have access to the answer. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, you did mention uh, Sheikh Mustafa Sabri. And uh, j just for our listeners, we, we have a two-part series on blogging theology called East Meets West. Kant, referring to Immanuel Kant, Kant and Mustafa Sabri Effendi. Uh, and, and it's a very interesting series demonstrating how Sheikh Mustafa engaged with Western thought and how he pretty much was ahead of his time in that sense. But I didn't want to distract uh, from, from the from the point. But uh, I think excellent. That's a very good, very good point you meant to mention there. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so, uh, actually I forgot. Well, yeah, so we were saying about this uh, Abdurrahman Badri's point that he was making. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the, 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 the preservation of the Quran, I think sometimes what tends to happen is we kind of think to ourselves, that the scholars have done it and there's no need to preserve the Quran anymore. But that's the issue. It's like a continuation. This is like you mentioned about the, you have to have this sort of mentality of preparation from before and containing the problem. And you, we don't have to necessarily publicize it, but we have to understand that this is going to be a, uh, you know, um, a, a, you know, you can almost say a generation thing. Every other generation would probably have their challenges and they have to be individuals prepared to be able to. And, and, and this reminds me of a statement of, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, where he says, where he says, uh, someone asked him that, you know, you are the Ara'ayti Yun. You people, like, you know, um, uh, come out with very uh, hypothetical scenarios for Fiki Masail. And then, so there was many scholars who were against this idea of hypothetical uh, mm -hmm. scenarios. And, and there were many who were for it. So he says, mm -hmm. And I think that's very important because Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, uh, if I mean, you, if you read his works, if you could just translate what you said, you know, so pr prepare oh, for tribulation sorry. before uh, it be uh, before it befalls. Yeah. yeah. So, so we prepare for uh, problems in society before they actually manifest themselves. We actually hit your home, right? We're ready. We know exactly how these things work. And uh, there was actually a very interesting. I mean, this is just off the off the topic, but I was reading about Imam Hanifa Rahimullah and his influence on 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 various societies. And one of the things I found was there's actually a historical group of uh, of Jews 
called the Akkarin, and, and in Arabic, I think they called them the Qarraun. Yeah. So Karaites, they called them the Karaites. Mm. So th there was a guy, their leader, apparently his name was Aaron something. He was going, I don't know, his lineage goes back to Harun alayhi salam. And he was in prison with Imam Hanifa rahimahullah. So they used to have debates. And Imam Hanifa rahimahullah, one of the things he said was, he said, uh, why don't you Jews, instead of relying upon your rabbis for the interpretation of your holy book, why don't you go back to the holy book and use principles, usul, methodology to try and derive an understanding? So that's what they're calling the Qarra'un because they were known as the, the reciters. But anyway, that was the first book, Mustafa Sauri's book. The second book, uh, which I really benefited from, from in, in regards to the discussion of Mu'jizah, was uh, by Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. And, um, you know, whatever people's opinions are about Ibn Taymiyyah on certain issues, I think people should never ignore the 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 the, the really good contribution that he's made to various areas, you know, whether that be, for example, things to do with mantiq, uh, or whether it's to do with things to do with uh, ijaz, mu'jizah, or how to even combat challenges that he was facing in his time. Because I think that's a, a lot of things people begin to... Um, become blind to which is when when a scot a scholar historically has made contributions if you don't know the challenges that he was facing and the society was facing or the eminent challenges that were arising you can't appreciate what he was doing and only people that come later on will probably be able to appreciate his arguments maybe the same can be said for imam ghazali as well um, on, on on his writing Ihya, and then he getting burnt in in spain then literally in, in public burning his books because they couldn't understand some of the statements he was making or where he was coming from. So Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he mentions in a book, which is known as a Nubuwat, this whole concept of, um, like, when a prophet Pro comes... Prophetology. 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 So prophetology, um, you know, when a prophet comes to the earth, sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mu'jizah that he's brought with, to what extent can that mu'jizah be replicated by people that come in the future? Like, is that mu'jizah, the staff of Musa alayhi salam, something that no human can ever replicate? Or is it something only the people at his time were unable to uh, to, to reproduce? Was that the case? So it's a very good book. I mean, I would definitely recommend anyone who's into this to actually look into that. Anyway, yeah, I, I, so, I, I benefited from uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, Nubuwat very much when I was... Um, doing my master's thesis on deism. Um, so deists are those that believe in a God, but they don't believe that God sends messengers and prophets. Um, and so one of, the, one of the arguments had to do with miracles and how can you differentiate between a true prophet and a false prophet. And I greatly benefited from uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's points. He lists, I, I think I, I recall he lists maybe a dozen ways to differentiate between yeah. Uh, a prophet and a uh, false prophet or a soothsayer. And uh, it's a very beneficial book. Uh, I, I believe there's an English translation of it, but I never read the English, so I can't vouch for it. But um, but who do, those who really uh, were able to read this book, you know, strong recommendation. Yeah, definitely. And, and his writings, I mean, he's got this, like my teacher used to say, because uh, one of my teachers actually wrote, he, he read his entire Majmu al-Fatawa. Wow, the whole thing he read it all so he goes uh, he says to me he says uh, he was saying that like, he was mentioning to me about those who are you know in support of of his statements and those who are against him and he was saying uh, you know that one of the things you can definitely say about Imam Taymi rahimahullah he was someone whose writing would would um, would, would capture you right mm. you know you're mesmerized by his writing the way that he shifts from one topic to another topic and comes back mm. he's very very good at that um, okay, so preservation of the meaning of the words. So this is the issue, second issue. If we believe that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we believe that the Quran that we have today is the same Quran that was um, left by the Prophet sallallahu to the Sahaba before he passed away, um, we have to also accept that the not only are the the the, the, the words of the Quran, the, the utteration, the recitation of the Quran, and the, the pronunciation of or articulation of the letters passed down from the Prophet Sallallahu we also have to accept <coughs> that the meanings of the Quran as well, the words themselves are the same in the meaning that's been passed down. This is very important to understand uh, simply because uh, many of us take it for granted that we have a Quran and we have a translation and we never think to ourselves, how do we know that this word means this? How do we know um, like something like 
Sirat means a path. Or how do we know, um, for example, like the word uh, muttaqin means someone who shields themselves. Or muflihun means someone who is successful. So this requires a person to appreciate, understand how historically uh, meanings were, were preserved as well. So the preservation of the words and their meanings were two important uh, projects that the Muslims um, they, they they took upon themselves historically. So the Qira'at, the Tajweed, and you know all of the so like history of uh, is very important. In fact, one of the criticisms that many of the Orientalists in the 1800s used to make was regarding the Qira'at. They couldn't understand how the Qira'at used to work, and they they made blatant objections that these were fabricated basically so w- w- what they kind of done was by 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 sort of like uh finding holes in poetry um they almost made an analogy and said well you know if poetry can be fabricated historically then what guarantee is there that the quran that the muslims how has is not void of of uh fabrications this was another thing that Taha Hussein is is, is 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 he's trying to keep his iman as well. He's trying to you know claim that he's still a Muslim, uh, in the sense that he's 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 upholding that the Quran is from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But the problem is, once you accept this chain of sort of um, objections or or doubts, once you accept one link of that chain, you have to accept these other links as well. And this is something which we'll talk about when we when we look into Taha Hussein. So preservations of meanings of the words. Now, when it comes to preservation of the meanings of the words, uh, dictionaries play a very important role in this, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, so I won't talk about that yet. <clears throat> Just for the general public, um, sometimes, like when we when we when we sit in a, a, a dars of tafsir, and the sheikh is explaining words to us, uh, we don't realize that these words, the sheikh cannot invent the meaning of a word. The sheikh cannot sit there and say something like, <clears throat> "Oh, you know what." Uh, you know, salat. Salat means um, like a religious program where people connect themselves with God, which was actually something that was done by individuals like uh, uh, Ghulam Ahmed Parvez. So Ghulam Ahmed Parvez was a uh, an individual that rejected uh, hadith yeah, to a degree. He rejected hadith and he claimed that he was only following Quran. And he in India, <clears throat> Indian subcontinent, this was something that slowly began to rise because of colonialism. So since colonialism started, again, Orientalism and colonialism, uh, uh, you know, have a very strong bond, right? You, you can't have one without the other. And these cor- cor- so-called sort of like Quran people or people who, I mean, I don't like to use the word Quran people because it makes it sound as though it's something which is legitimate. But rather than that, I would say people who reject hadith. So these rejectors of hadith, like uh, Ghulam and Parvez, I remember reading in one of his tafsirs, um, uh, he's got a tafsir called uh, Matalib al-Furqan, uh, and in there he actually writes this. He's, he's, he comes out with some absurd claims. But what you have to understand is he's doing exactly the same thing that um, he's doing exactly the same thing that um, Orientalists were doing, which was you come out with your conclusion, you come out with your uh, your, 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 your pre-disposed um, um, you know, uh, understanding, idea, and then you try to find proofs to 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 support that, right? Again, this is something which, uh, as Muslims, we have to be very careful about this. So this guy was saying, Salat is not what Muslims understand it today, that they go to the mosque and then they put their head down on the floor five times a day. Um, it's supposed to be a way of connecting yourself with God. Basically, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a communal way of cr- establishing godliness in the community. That's what it is. Yeah, so they link and, it to, to Sila, Sila connection and they just Maybe, most likely, in that bare form probably most likely and, and he he said something like he said hajj is just today it's a carnival today he goes what, what's happening today is a big carnival this isn't the hajj the quran quran uh, uh, endorses the quran talks about hajj meaning every human has the right to come to makkah and to see uh the house of god i don't know what that's going to achieve but they have the right to see the house of God, and and this is meant to sort of like be a proof for them that they, you know, they they have free sort of like access to Islam. Anyway, so this is another thing I think when a lot of people don't understand when they read translations of the Quran that are inspired by Orientalists, you have to be very very careful because 
We don't understand what's the reason for why they've translated this particular verse in this particular way. Um, and this, again, fits in with the Orientalist approach of how, like Edward Said, who wrote a book called Orientalism, um, and this was a, one of the first like uh, coinages of the word Orientalism. And he, he, he says to the nearest effect, he says that what basically is happening is the West is using their ideals uh, as being superior and then expecting everyone else to try and live up to them. Right? And then you kind of fit your tafsir around their ideals. And, and interestingly enough, if you look at a lot of the tafsirs that were written uh, between the 1800s to you know almost mid-1900s, you'll find that a lot of them are inspired by uh, this idea of trying to rationalize things in the Quran, even if it means rejecting uh, orthodox views about them, the concept of angels. Like in India, there was Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan who wrote, um, you know, uh, about this as well. And he was known as the sort of like, you know, modernist uh, uh, um, individual ideal in, in India, rejecting the idea of there being shaitan as being entities, rather that it's just like an impulse, a negative impulse that person feels. Um, again, and the problem with this approach, you're not preserving the Quran because what's happening is, if every generation is going to almost, I mean, nothing's wrong with ta'weed. Interpretation of a verse is totally fine as long as it's in line with a sound methodology that has, has been passed down from the early generations. And interpretation of, for example, like certain uh, uh, cosmological uh, sort of like um, things, um, bodies or, you know, uh, uh, science and these kind of things in the Quran, that's fine. Nothing's wrong with that. As long as again it doesn't sort of like clash with this methodology. The problem is if every generation is gonna almost try to reinvent the whole concept of how you look at the Quran, then what's gonna happen is a generation will come like the Christians had in the the, 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 the same problem that they, they're facing or many of them are facing, which is um that now you don't know exactly what was the belief held by the, the early people of Christianity. We, we we won't have any understanding of that, and then Islam will simply become something which has no validity. It's up to you what you want Islam to be. Mm. Uh, and that's what, unfortunately, certain individuals would like. Um, and, and this is why we're trying to explain this, is the preservation of the meanings of the words. <clears throat> I remember uh, um, he he wrote a uh, PhD um, on uh, a, a fiqh book called Hidayah, which is a, a Hanafi, Hanafi um, advanced fiqh manual. And one of the things that he wrote, he said, the Hanafi uh, Hanafi fiqh is based upon three things, right? Three foundations. The first foundation is language. As in, the Hanafis believe that the language is qat'i, is categorical. The meanings of the word of the Quran are categorical, just as the words of the Quran are categorical. As in, if you don't believe that the meanings are categorical, uh, in the sense that, you know, the, the general, most of them, some of them, there's ikhtilaf in exactly what the word means. But if you don't believe that the words are categorical, then what's going to happen is every individual uh, can interpret the words of the Quran you know, as they want. Mm. This is the first thing. And that's why Hanafis focus a lot. Half of their usul books are dedicated, dedicated to um, how language works, how words are understood, like khas and am, mm. and what does min mean, what does fi mean, what does mutlaq, muqayyad. Right, so 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 he understood even the Sahaba and the Tabi'in had an understanding of how you use these concepts. I was actually, um, and this reminds me, Zal. So when I graduated in two thousand nine, um, I began to teach at a local institute, a Sufa institute, and um, there, there there was these two guys who contacted me, and they they had lots of questions. They were bombarded with people used to ask them. So I said, look. I can answer your questions for you on a weekly basis, or I can explain some basic. Um, I can explain to you some basic concepts in Islam, and that way, most of the questions you'll easily be able to, to you know, to answer them yourselves. So what I did was I took, like, I think it was about 10, 15, I don't know, some basic concepts um, of of Quran, how a Muslim should understand Quran, uh, um, and how a Muslim should understand Hadith, and how a Muslim should understand Fiqh. So I took these and I began to teach it to them. Eventually, this slowly became uh, a book I was writing, which is <laughs> Allah knows when that book is going to come into uh, fruition. Uh, it was I, I called it Evolution of Fiqh, which was basically 
how fiqh developed over the years in the in in the eras. And one section of that it was basically fiqh in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how it was understood, <coughs> fiqh in the time of the Khulafa, fiqh in the time of the Tabi'een, fiqh in the time of Taba Tabi'een. And the idea was to go, and just for the layperson, just to show them that when we say the four madhahib, the four madhahib does not mean that, you know, in a puff or in a vacuum, they just came out with all these rules yeah. and everything. There's actually a whole process of how they looked at language, how they looked at, um, you know, the concept of principles of hadith and how they looked at how um, concepts, you know, uh, um, urf as well. So, so, so I went through that, and this is this is what made me, you know, sort of like interested in this as well. How, when it came to the Hanafis, Sheikh Suhail Hanif says words are very important. The meaning of words has to be categorical. And the second is that the the widespread practice of the Sahaba, <clears throat> similar to what the Malikis have in the Ahl Medina, the you know the, the Urf of Ahl Medina, yeah. um, and uh, but this was but like in or, the days. Or, 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 orf is custom means custom, custom yeah. The yeah. custom of the the practice of the people of Medina, um, which was the Imam Hanifa rahimullah was living. Uh, you could almost say at the border of Sahaba time and Tabi'in time, so he could see a lot of what was being passed down physically by generations. Um, and the third was the understanding of there being rational sort of like illas, uh, legal sort of um, reasons behind why things are legislated in Islam. Right? There has to be a reason why something legislated, and there could be certain things that are beyond our understanding, but we still accept them. Mm. So, and this was the thing Mu'jiza fitted in with as well, because a Mu'jiza you don't have to, you don't have to see a Mu'jiza as being something contrary to the system of the world that we're living in today. So this natural, you know, order of things that happens in the world. A mu'jiza is something like Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah, he mentioned as well. He said, if you see as simply khariqun lil ada, as in the ada occurs a thousand times something happens and you're used to it. And then maybe a thousand and one times something else can occur. Right? It doesn't have to follow that, that norm that you're used to. And the same thing is when we accept the Quran, the, the, the words of the Quran, we have to accept that every single word of the Quran was intended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mean that. And he was understood by the Prophet Sallallahu and then he was passed down by him. And then now we are slowly passing it down and we're refining this as well as things go by. Sometimes someone might write something which is incorrect in a tafsir and then like, you know, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he'll come and he'll say, well, you know, so-and-so wrote this in his tafsir and from this, this and this, he's actually incorrect in this. He actually is supposed to be this. And and that's that's something which is part of the whole preservation as well. It's correcting ourselves as well. Alhamdulillah. Okay, now the third <clears throat> the third uh, issue here is Muslim uh, historical endeavors as well. So, tafsirs and dictionaries uh, again, the average Muslim might not be aware of this, but um, tafsirs is a vast ocean of uh, of books that the scholars have written. Yeah. A Muslim does not have to read all the tafsir books, but it's important to understand what types of tafsir books scholars wrote. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the, from the earliest years, what we understand is some of the earliest tafsirs that were written. Were language were were, were tafsirs based upon uh, linguistics, mm. yeah the the meaning of words basically, and there's actually a famous um, individual, although he's a Khariji, uh, Nafi ibn Azraq, mm. uh, who actually you know started a movement the uh, Azariqa, yeah, uh, but he came to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu at one point, <clears throat> and they say, this is mentioned by. Uh, um, uh, Ah, skip my mind now. But if I remember, I'll mention it. Um, it's it's in um, most of the tafsirs have quoted incidents, even in Sahih Bukhari as well. There is mm. um, indication towards a man coming to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, Sayyid Ibn Jubair, saying, you know, جَاءَ رَجُلٌ إلَى إِبْنَ أَبَاسٍ وَس وَكَانَ إِنْدُهُ بَعْدَ الْأَسْئَلَةِ أَوْ سَأَلَهُ وَكَذَا وَكَذَا وَكَذَا. He asked him like all these questions, and <clears throat> he would say to Ibn Abbas, he would say, he says, I'm going to ask you questions, and you have to explain from language, from a purely language point, uh, the meanings of these words. <clears throat> and Ibn Abbas said, fine. And Ibn Abbas would bring poems and words. And, you know, he, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, said, um, that the word haraj in the Quran, laysa alaykum uh, fi dinim in haraj. He asked a Bedouin, he said, mal haraj indakum? He said, adiq. He said, haraj is being constricted, restrictiveness. He said, yeah, that's, that's what it means. As in, he understood you take the language from these people. So <clears throat> from the early years, the, the seas that were being written were a very <clears throat> linguistic. 
you can actually i mean if someone doesn't have access to if someone doesn't have access to uh, books of tafsir um, you can actually go online and there's lots and lots of you know pdfs available you can use shamila you can use turas and these yeah. and you can go through the tafsir list and look chronologically you'll find the earliest tafsirs that were written um, like uh, one of the earliest ones that was compiled by um, or edited by Sheikh Ahmed Shakir and his brother Mahmoud Shakir as well, which was a Tafsir Tabari. Yeah. I think it's in 19 volumes that they compiled in. And uh, you can see in there as well that <clears throat> there were many, many, many um, like uh, istishadat uh, shi'ariya. Yeah, so many poems, which inshallah I'll try to um, touch on a bit later on. So then what happened was scholars began to um, dis look at tafsirs and delve into tafsirs from different aspects. So, for example, if there was someone who was <clears throat> into, let's say, fiqh, he would begin to look at ayats from a fiqh point of view. Mm -hmm. And then some of the scholars would look at um, uh, uh, ayats from a aqidah point of view. And mm -hmm. some of the scholars would look at them from a, um, from a nahu point of view, Arabic grammar point of view, and so on. So you had all of these tafsirs <clears throat> being written. And then even outside of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, you had Mu'tazila tafsir, you had um, uh, you know, Shia tafsir, and you had all these different taf tafsirs that were being written as the time went by. So tafsirs clearly show that there was being, uh, there, there was a, um, there was a, uh, a conscious sort of like effort that was being made by scholars over the years of preservation of meanings. Preservation of meanings was understood even way before, um, like we're going to mention about Taha Hussein's claims, even way before there was a there was this effort, a concerted effort. Dictionaries is another thing. So <clears throat> if you mention tafsirs, you have to mention dictionaries. Mm. So <clears throat> one of the earliest dictionaries that was actually compiled in detail is said to be the dictionary of uh, Khalil bin Ahmad al-Farahidi. So Khalil bin Ahmad was um, in the roughly in the in the early 100s, yeah, in the early second century, and he wrote uh, several works. One of them, which they say is still preserved till today, is the Kitab al Ain. So the Kitab al Ain is basically a dictionary, and he starts off with the letter Ain, which is a letter which emanates from a certain part of the throat. So the the way that he sequences the words that he's going to investigate is by looking at their point of articulation. So that shows they already had an understanding of articulation as well. They knew this before. The Arabs knew this. And they had a understanding of words as well. The only thing was there, there wasn't anyone there who had possibly um, you know, codified all of this, recorded all of this in one place in this, in this way. So he writes this. And uh, then this becomes something which almost becomes one of the earliest works that people start relying upon. But this isn't the only source that they're relying upon. Because just like you have written you have written documentation of Arabic words, you also had oral transmission that was still continuing. Mm. In fact, <clears throat> the uh, the linguists, they also mentioned, they say, um, the language which is still used as um, as evidence and proof to understand words of the Qur'an, al-ihtijaj, al al ihtijaj bihi, continued all the way until the 150 Hijri. Yeah. So 150 years after Hijrah, all the way up to there, from before Hijrah, all the Arab a a Arabic writing and poetry and that's been passed down was still used as evidence. Only after 150 did the scholars put restrictions and slowly stop accepting um, like newly used words mm. that they were finding. Mm. Um, there was they stopped using it, uh, and this was simply because. Um, B uh, Bashar ibn Burud and others this was simply because what was happening was um, a foreign influence Persian influence because Persia was also had a, had a rich history of uh, poetry and their language and this was slowly coming in and this was affecting the meanings of words so yeah. to make it easy for people to understand imagine um, there's a word imagine I've got this circle over here my, my palm of my hand so imagine a word in Arabic means all of this in the time of the revelation of Quran and then when from, from outside a word comes and it starts to influence this slowly, the meaning of this word, it starts to sort of like decline now. So now 90%. So when you say, for example, let's say the word Sayyara, yeah. or let's say the word Dabba, yeah. Dabba tul Ard. In the time of the Quran, it had a specific meaning that, that entailed all these individual aspects. But now slowly when you when you start to introduce or use the word um, from, from a different language or from a different usage, yeah. the, the original meaning shrinks. 
until now you're left with dabba it simply just means maybe like a, an animal or something yeah um the word sayara is the same nowadays if you think of sayara you think of a car but in the olden days it had a specific connotation meaning so this is how languages expand yeah. and languages shrink in their meanings as well <clears throat> and this is not just this is not just um, specific to the arabic language there was a documentary that i <clears throat> that i came across which i think is very useful for I, i usually tell my students to watch it it's a six part documentary bbc made it um it was about how the king's james <clears throat> king james bible yeah. um had an influence on the english language even till today oh, so wow. a lot of phrases that we have and how uh, the people who were translating the king's james bible um they actually and this is a lesson for us muslims as well they would adjust meanings of words because they felt that the original meaning or so called original meaning was too harsh mm. wasn't befitting the society so they adjusted some of those meanings and this is again we have to be careful with this idea when we translate qurans as well just because it might be might not be politically correct in our times to have this particular verse translated in this particular way it doesn't necessarily it doesn't mean for a muslim that we have to adjust it uh it might be interpretation someone has but we have to keep the quran preserved now this brings me on to <clears throat> um so we talked about dictionaries now as dictionaries continued over the years <clears throat> some of the like amazing dictionaries um uh, you know students ask me about dictionaries and i say to them look just don't bother reading uh, hans weir the rest of your life because hans weir was i mean from what i have understood Hans Weir was written by um, a, a Nazi in N Nazi Germany yeah and he actually was was commissioned to write this dictionary um in order for uh, Mein Kampf to be translated into Arabic yeah. so you have to understand when students come to me and say to me look you know um Ustad you mentioned <clears throat> to look in Hans Weir but Hans Weir mentions the translation of this word as this and it's clearly a meaning you can't take in the Quran yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very strange So I, I suggest to students to look in the, the the dictionaries. One of the <clears throat> classical dictionaries that's been written by <coughs> scholars is a dictionary which is um, by uh, an Imam Ibn Sida. Yeah. Ibn Sida was a Spanish scholar, and he wrote several dictionaries. Two of his dictionaries are actually ten volumes long. First time I actually saw that was <clears throat> I don't know if you remember in the early two thousands there used to be a website called Al Al Warraq. that was one of the first ever websites i saw that had this whole uh, repository of islamic books in in digital form right mm -hmm. and i think it was a, a lebanese website or something i'm not too sure mm -hmm. it was what rock and in there i saw this dictionary and i was uh, and i was uh, skimming through it and i've never seen that dictionary in my life and this guy has written a two dictionary one of them is like a normal standard dictionary going through you know alphabetical order and the other one Oh by the way when we say alphabetical order it's not our alphabet it's like it's weird they go from first letter and last letter so it's like you go alif alif so alif and then whatever is in the middle alif and then alif whatever is in the middle ba and alif yeah so if you're looking for daraba you got to look for dad and then you have to look for ba so uh, the second dictionary okay. he wrote was okay uh -huh. the second one he wrote was a dictionary that was uh, that was basically he goes through every aspect of a, of, of an object uh in detail everything that's reached him from the arabs so things like the eye the different shapes of eyes or the different shapes of eyelashes or the different color of eyes it goes to all these words which i i probably never even will use in my life never hear of but you're amazed that arabs used to use these words somewhere and i remember this uh you know when i first came across the book fiqh al-lugha uh al-fa'alabi fiqh al-lugha So there was a, a student in our madrasa from Gaza um I, and, and and I was saying with him and I said to him look why why did the scholars write fiqh al lugha when we hardly ever see like 90% of these words in the fiqh al lugha and these dictionaries we hardly ever see them in, <clears throat> in the arabic so he said basically he said to me <clears throat> a lot of these words are from arabic that's almost you can say in a uh, literature that's extinct to us Mm. Uh, that's not ac accessible to us it's in manuscript form maybe mm. but there there was a usage of them in, in the past mm -hmm. and um, uh, he mentioned to me that abul ala al mari he also mentions this no no al mari 
ابونا ماري او ابن الجي ابن الجني اي فاوند ابن الجني ورك ورك سو خصائص ابن الجني از ورك خصائص اند ان ذا هي اكشلي منشند اباوت ا um, vast majority of arabic hasn't reached us like you know when, when there was a, uh, when there was like a, a study done on um, the, the the number of words in a particular language and i don't know english has about 600,000 or spanish has about 400,000 you know i don't know exactly uh, arabic has from all of the dictionaries put together and all the works <clears throat> has about 12 million from what's already recorded and the unrecorded we don't even know how much unrecorded is out there so so that shows us historically and and by the way ibn sida is a blind individual he's born blind now you imagine a guy that's born blind that allah I mentioned in the beginning where you know there's so many people serving the deen of allah in different ways you know it's amazing and this blind individual in spain he 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 writes these books or he gets these books compiled So dictionaries, historical dictionaries, again, is a very important thing uh, for for Muslims to understand how it plays a very important role of how the deen has been protected by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala through these through these works. <clears throat> okay, now now once we understand tafsirs and dictionaries, um, and and I'm not going into if someone wants to read further, I would definitely encourage them to read <clears throat> about. <clears throat> Arabic grammar the development of Arabic grammar as well because I I personally think the development of Arabic grammar was one of the most amazing things that the Muslims ever came out with right how they understood the preservation of the Quran depended upon understanding the structure of the grammar and how precise it was as well so I would definitely encourage people to look into that number 4 I think is about orientalism and orientalists rather orientalists <clears throat> these are um, you know So orientalists um is very important to understand how they came about or not necessarily came about but uh, historically where they sort of made the most uh, impact on uh, people like Taha Hussein <clears throat> So orientalists <clears throat> the definition of orientalism um there are many definitions that people have 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 listed um however i think uh, probably the easiest way to understand orientalism is um those people those westerners because the definition of orientalists change historically so if you understand it historically it'll make more sense <clears throat> so when it came to the first individuals historically to actually start to um study the east those who are studying the east uh, re- uh some of the records show that they actually was this was in the time of um i think it was like 300 yeah after common era yeah about 300 uh, or so where there's records of individuals who were translating um, semitic texts into um, european languages uh, then we have um, when muslims came about you had um, individuals again there were certain kings as well certain non-muslim kings <clears throat> uh, in europe uh, sicily um, and other places that were translating the muslims work so initially what was happening was um non muslims were interested in just understanding what the muslims knew right so just like when muslims came to power uh, and started to spread around, uh, around the world muslims were interested in uh, foreign cultures so ibn taymiyyah rahimullah writes <coughs> about this as well and um <coughs> i think it's in risala safdiya i think it's there but it's also in a, a book by um if anyone's interested abjad al ulum is a very good book by um uh sheikh um um uh, al-qinnoji uh hasan qinnoji um so hasan nawab khan qinnoji he is written several books like one of the books that he's written is a um a abridgment of fatul qadir by shokani and he's also written um um abjad al ulum which is a very good book which basically he goes through alphabetically sciences that the muslims have contributed to or developed and he talks about mantik and mantik and doesn't like mantik and he says about mantik he says basically uh, ibn taymi rahimullah mentioned this as well that this was the muslims early muslims um trying to understand greek science of of uh, mantik and they basically asked the the romans at that time can can you can you ship a whole load of your library on mantik to us and they <clears throat> when they did when they uh, they did mashwara when they consulted the 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 priests the the priest said well 
if you want to if you want to cause cracks in the beliefs of the Muslims, then hand it over to them. Yeah, because these books will just do that. Eventually, what happens is books were translated into Arabic. Muslims started to um, develop mantik, the science of mantik and philosophy. Um, and then, you know, you have all this history of, of this happening. Um, <clears throat> I think important thing to understand in, in our particular presentation is um, a statement which uh, which uh, a worker, uh, Ibn Arabi, uh, famous uh, Maliki scholar, um, he writes about his teacher, Imam Ghazali, um, I don't know to what degree is this statement true or not, but I think it makes sense in our discussion. He says, he says, uh, uh, our teacher, Imam Ghazali, Bala'a al-Falsafa fa'arada an yataqayya'ha uh, and I think this is what happens to us. What happens is he's basically oh, saying can, can that Imam Ghazali had. Can you translate oh, sorry, that? Can you translate yeah. that? Yeah. Imam Ghazali, I apologize. Yeah. Imam Ghazali has has absorbed philosophy uh, to such a degree that now he wants to um, remove it from himself and separate himself from philosophy. Uh, he's unable to. And that's what happens with Orientalism, I think, as well. When a person studies Orientalism or understands Islam through the lens of the Orientalist, mm -hmm. what happens is that your mind shifts and things are seen in such a different way. It's very difficult for you now to readjust them to look at how the you know classical scholars saw things. Mm -hmm. And for us living in the West, and especially the Muslims that are influenced and affected by or Orientalists, is is the same thing. So <clears throat> this is what was happening slowly. So initially the the scholars they were looking at orientalism or the no, sorry uh, the the non-muslims were looking at the sciences of the muslims purely to understand what the muslims knew then as the years shifted <clears throat> and colonialism started in the industrial revolution and the west now started to have you know military uh, presence um around the world this is where um you know spain collapsed as well this is the same time that ottoman empire sort of start, came came about gained strength but the problem was <clears throat> the same thing happened there, which was now that these non-Muslims were trying to understand the Muslims' works simply to to dissect it and to find the faults and to to critique it and to give them uh, an upper hand over the Muslims, and um, it really it really kind of uh, became problematic uh, in the eighteen hundreds, where colonialism in Africa, especially in Africa and the Indian subcontinent, it took off. And uh, again, like we said earlier on, Orientalism and colonialism was hand in hand. This is why when you look at the definitions of um, Orientalism, there's a there's a book, uh, it's called, um, it's called uh, Al-Mustashrikuna was sunnah Yeah, Al-Mustashrikuna was sunnah So Al-Mustashrikuna was sunnah he mentions some of the definitions. <clears throat> um, I can't remember exactly where I put it. I was going to bring the definitions, but you can read it there anyway. And he was saying, then what happened was <clears throat> the problem came and this is what Edward Said says as well, was that Orientalism now <clears throat> had laid down the, the standard for morality and the standard for academia and the standard for economics and the standard for politics. And so the West now saw themselves as superior to everyone else. And when they would study, <clears throat> when they would study Islam, they studied Islam almost like studying something that was um, that had no value at all. It was just like a hobby. You study, you break it down. And, you know, you teach them of the errors that they had in their own sciences. And this is what they were doing. So they were coming across, in you can almost say in a bit of a, in an arrogant way, that their ideals are the ultimate ideals and Muslims should be learning from them, right? And <clears throat> this is where, you know, Taha Hussein and people like him were influenced. Um like Taha Hussein, <clears throat> there was also another individual. His name was, he was a minister in the Egyptian government. I think it was in, it, it, it was roughly about, um, let me see. Yeah, this was, his name was Abdul Aziz Basha. Abdul Aziz Basha. So Abdul Aziz Basha, he <clears throat> came out with an idea, right? And his idea was this, that he said, and this is the same time uh, Kamal Ataturk, he wanted to Latinize the Turkish language and Latinize everything. Um, Abdul Aziz Basha's he wrote a whole book um, and it was dedicated to um, Latinizing the Quran as in 
now we don't need the Arabic language script anymore. We're going to keep the Arabic language, but we're just going to move everyone from reading Arabic into reading the Quran, but in Latin. Um, and his argument for this was, this was his argument for this, and it's strange, got something like strange arguments. His argument for this was, the Arabic language uh, today has caused the Muslims now to fall back, yeah, to become, to, to, to fall so behind the West that it's because of the Arabic script that they're not developing their sciences. And number two <clears throat> is that the Arabic language <clears throat> stemmed from mushriks, like the origins of the Arabic language from mushriks, and the origins of Latin are from uh, Ahl Kitab. So therefore, we should, um, you know, change everything into Latin script, and um, and then the Muslims will. So he had this idea. Again, where did he get this from? He got this from Orientalists that existed already had these ideas um, in France. Yeah, so he had studied in France as well. Um, and they had these ideas that you know. Um, I think there was a there was a there was a, a Wilcox who was a, who was an engineer. Yeah, so Wilcox, oh, William Wilcox, his name is. So he was an engineer in <clears throat> an engineer in uh, in the UK in Britain basically, and he was sent to Egypt to build a dam, Aswan Dam. Right, it's one of the biggest projects. And he actually said this about this is comments that he made, and he was saying that look, these Muslims are backwards people, you know, they're just concerned about their religion. And Abdul Aziz Basha, he took this, and then Sheikh Ahmad Shakir, who was at the same time, he actually wrote a rebuttal, and the book uh, is called this is this is the book. It's really it's a really good book to read, very short. <clears throat> it's called Ash Sharu wa Lugha, Ash Sharu wa Lugha. So he 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 goes through the entire book of Abdul Aziz Basha and he breaks it down and he explains why it's so important for the Arabic script to remain. Um, and one of the arguments he gives is he says that um, um, like if you were to rewrite some, he gave examples of some Arabic words into into Latin. One of the problems would be that a time would come where people would not know um, the various qiraat. As in the Muslims, what they had done was they had preserved their language in the form of the qiraat in the in the in the khat the the khat uh, you know the, the rasmul uthmani, and that was in itself was something which preserved the major qiraat inside that khat inside that writing, and he was against this. He was saying no. He his idea was the Muslim made a, a big blunder historically when they tried to come out with the Arabic writing. It messed everything up. And this is one of the arguments Taha Hussein seems to uh, indicate towards, <clears throat> which he says that uh, the Qira'at were made up. So, so you know, um, he gets this from uh, people that came before him. Yeah. Um, but he said the Qira'at were made up. It was basically the, uh, and this is what um, Ahmad Shakir says. He says there's two groups now. The Orientalist argument is the Khat was written. Khat al-Uthmani was written, Rasm al-Uthmani was written. And then the people attempted to try and come out with recitations that fitted that, that, that Rasm al-Uthmani. And he says, but the Muslims always believe the Qira'a came first. And then the Rasm al-Uthmani came afterwards to try and uh, uh, contain all those various Qira'at. Right? So this was <clears throat> Abdul, Abdul Aziz Bashan. He was at the same time as Taha Hussein. So again, Orientalists were already having an influence on Muslims in this. Um, <clears throat> now, contributions that they've made without a doubt, <clears throat> um, to say that um, Orientalism or Orientalists are, are, are problematic, are 100%, and they have, no, they have not contributed any benefit. Obviously, you know, everyone provides benefit. I mean, even look at the Arabic numbers. The Arabic numbers that we have um, are actually Indian numbers. They came from India. Um, you, if you look at things like... Um, <clears throat> Um, sciences, Muslim sciences as well. They're not really Muslim sciences. It's actually sciences that the Muslims uh, developed and many other people later on contributed to them. Um, so what are the, some of the things, contributions that uh, Orientists made? So so first of all, in, um, in the early 1800s, early 1800s this is, um, the, the Orientalists had, well, if you want to use the word stolen, might be more more precise, but they had acquired 
over 260,000 manuscripts of the Muslims in their libraries. 260,000. Yeah, just think about that. These are manuscripts that Muslims were not using. They were in their libraries. And so what the what these and that was in 1800s, that is. This is a uh, Dr. Bashar Awad said this, Dr. Bashar Awad, who, who's really into uh, editing and manuscripts. And he was saying, you can't deny the contribution that they made, 260,000. And then he said that was in the 1800s. And today, there's going to be way more that they've, they've, they've acquired over the years. Germany has, you know, books. He even said himself, Dr. Bashar Awad, <clears throat> he said, he said, I had to pay 2,000 pounds, $2,000 to get access to a uh, manuscript in a German library, two thousand pounds that Muslims didn't have, and he, he his argument was this: that Orientalists they revived in the Muslims the importance of preserving their manuscripts and doing tahqiq of them, you know, critical editions of them, um, and I think that's something which now, Alhamdulillah, around the world, Muslims have taken very seriously now. So you see in Turkey lots of new publications coming out, Saudi Arabia, you see in Egypt as well. Um, this whole sort of like revival movement of, of manuscripts. So that's one of the things that Orientalists did. Second thing that Orientalists did was, one of the things about the Orientalists that was <clears throat> that was mentioned, this is, there's a book actually, it's called Al-Mushtashriqoon. Um, it's called Al-Mushtashriqoon by a Lebanese uh, Christian scholar. Uh, he's, he's, he's Lebanese. Um, his name is, is uh, Al-Aqiqi. Uh, something Al-Aqiqi, slipped my mind. It's a very big book, and he's actually documented in there all the works, major works from the 1800s that Orientalists have done in alphabetical order. He's missed like uh, quite a few out, but I mean, literally thousands of names there. Um, and <clears throat> so, one of the things that uh, they've uh, focused on. I just want to say, uh, his name is Najib Al Aqiqi. Najib Al Aqshukra, Najib Al Aqiqi. So, this is a very good book. Um, Al Mushtashriqun. There's also, if you want another good book on Mushtashriqun, Abdul Rahman Al Badawi has a book, Mosu' Al Mushtashriqin, yeah, which is he goes through major, major Mushtashriqin and you know, lists their biographies as well. But this one's much more, much more, um, extensive. So, the the, the Mushtashriqun, the Orientalists, what have they done? So, they've written books like that, that Muslims would never have written. So, for instance, like there is a Mustashrik, a German Mustashrik who has, who wrote, <coughs> who wrote Al Mosu'a, uh, Al Mosu'a to, uh, 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 which was basically an encyclopedia of the um, hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from uh, 10 books. So, what he's done is alphabetical order. And I used to, I, when I first came across this book, I think it was about 10 years ago, maybe, <coughs> I would use this book. And this was before. I, I got familiar with Shamila and all these. Now I've left it. But this book, you know, he basically, any hadith, like let's say you, you, you come across a hadith where it says, uh, ma aman ahabba, and you want to you wanna know, okay, where are all the places where the word ahabba comes in hadith? So this guy spent 30 years, a non-Muslim, compiling this mursu'atu al-fad and al-hadith uh, al-nabawiyah. And Ahabba, and he mentions all the hadith, and he, he brings the first few words of the hadith and tells you exactly which chapter and which book. So seven volumes, and people like you know um, uh, uh, Dr. Fuad Abdul Baqi, who, who was who was working in Germany as well at that time. I think he was a um, he was a professor there, and he even says he says if I had access to to works like that, so 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 much of my research would have done be done in a short span of time. Um, you know, Fuad Abdul Baqi is one of the guys who has put all the numbers on a lot of these hadith works that you find. Um, so again, it's a lot of Orientalists who have actually started these projects off. Then you have a lot of the Dawawin, <clears throat> the, the, the the writings of poetry have been revived editions because of Orientalists. Um, you know, they may have mistakes in there, but it's now given Muslims now a reason for why they need to start working harder now. Um, this was uh, in an article I read, um, this was, maybe 20 years ago. Um, in Egypt, they were saying in Egypt, um, out of all of the manuscripts that they had, only 8% of them have been um, uh, published, you know, re re ed edited and published. 8%. So you imagine now 92% are still in libraries and require people to get access to them before they start deteriorating. Um, so these guys did a lot of work, without a doubt. And 
they've also done another thing I think it's very important for us to understand, which is they've laid down for us um, like an approach of how to academically approach writing in an honest way. Whether they do it in an honest way or not, that's a separate thing. But for Muslims, you know, honest uh, research, you know, uh, you know, trying not to let your your biases or your emotions get to you when you're writing something, they do that very well, right? Having everything referenced and bibliography and contents page, something you don't find in uh, uh, classical works. Like, you know, uh, I remember once I came across uh, Fahadis li, li Sahil Bukhari, and I was thinking, Fahadis li Sahil Bukhari, when we buy Bukhari and the back, there's always a Fahadis, there's always a contents page, right? Or the front. So why do we, but we didn't realize that the scholars didn't write those. Those were written by people that came later on. So clearly these people have, you know, refined the, the art of um, investigation. Um, and, you know, spend, these guys spend their entire life simply on like one topic. They will spend their whole life writing about one topic. Now, Alhamdulillah, you know, we have scholars who are of a higher caliber um, and a, we believe as a, on a higher moral um, standard they have. Problems that the Mushashrikin bring now. So what are the major problems they bring? So one of the biggest problems that these individuals, they do not believe in Allah as we believe in Allah. And they do not believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you, when, when, when you look at um, Islamic science, we don't realize how these people write compared to how an average Muslim scholar would write. When these people write, they believe that, they, that the words of Allah are not Allah's words. These are Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi words. And even there, they believe that he was a human being and he made errors and he had his own uh, aims and objectives and so forth. So they come out with all of these things. This is where we have to be very careful with um, the, the the reasons for why they're writing. Um, <clears throat> now, this is not to say, this is not to say that Orientalists are all bad and that they all have this agenda that they simply want to undermine Islam in everything that they write. We, you know, without a doubt, that's not the case with everyone. Alhamdulillah, there's many Orientalists who are actually um, countering this um, colonial sort of like representation of Orientalism. Um, like, for example, um, Edward Said. So Edward Said's book was one of the first that was actually um, a response to this Orientalist approach. Um, and the people like... Um, um, Georgi Zaydan. Georgi Zaydan also did a lot of rebuttal against Taha Hussein as well. And George al Makdisi. And now in today's time, Wail Halak as well. Um, we don't have to take everything they say, but you know, to appreciate that they have contributed something to respond to certain things. Um, you know, again, is something which which they've done. But the vast majority of Orientalists, especially the ones that were between the you know 1800s all the way to the 1950s, these were the ones that we have to be very careful about because those are the ones whose writings were inspiration for people like Taha Hussein and then people like um, uh, uh, um, although the, although although you know Allah Allah uh, our state uh, he, uh, whether he's a Muslim or not uh, Muhammad um, uh, Arkun so Muhammad Arkun is a uh, you know a, a Jazair a Algerian Algerian um, scholar who again has very strange, <clears throat> strange sort of like positions with regards to certain Muslim. Uh, like for example, he believes, this is what he believes this is. He believes that uh, Quran went, went through many stages. So some of the Quran is the words of the Prophet Wasallam. He believes nothing is Allah's words. He believes Wahid itself, it's a new definition he gives it. The Quran, some of it's Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's words. Then what happened later on was, um, some of it is... Um, Abu Bakr Radhan's words when Abu Bakr did the compilation. Some of it, stage three, is Uthman radiallahu anhu's words. And then some of it is a stage later on. People have. So basically, the Quran, he believes that the Quran has words and verses inserted into them. There's certain verses and certain words. And he says the reason why Muslims did that was to make sense of ayats. He believes that when the ayats were revealed, they were scattered and they didn't make sense. So in order for them to make sense, Muslims were inserting their own sort of like uh, interjecting and adding their own tafsir, you know, slash ayah. So he believes in these kind of things. And then he's, he's got some other strange beliefs. Um, Allah alam, you know, state of that. Uh, yeah, you uh, know, a, a lot of criticism about Arkun revolve around his uh, al-manhaj al-tafkiki or what we call deconstructionism. 
uh, which is a form of postmodernism where pretty much, you know, uh, you could interpret words and assign them meanings, uh, you know, uh, uh, as you wish. Right. And, and, you know, so a lot of the things that we're taught that you're speaking about today, your Mufti, you know, in terms of preservation of meaning, I mean, this is very anti deconstructionism, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whereby you, you could de deconstruct words and their meanings as you wish. It's just a form of postmodernism. And, uh, you know, Abun, <laughs> well, you know, that was also one of his uh, uh, flaws, unfortunately. Yeah. So, so deconstruction is exactly, <clears throat> I mean, he even has like things like what does wahi mean? What's the mm. true meaning of wahi? Mm. What's the true meaning of um, <clears throat> of of these kind of thing like salat and rabb and exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so um, there's also some some other individuals who are really pushing behind the scenes um, to try. Uh, uh, and there was a Christian, uh, a Coptic Christian, by the name of um, uh, Salama Musa. So Salama Musa was also. Um, very active in he studied in France as well. He came back. He came back with a lot of ideas, and he didn't like Islam. Like he's, he he openly didn't like Islam, and he was highly influenced by by um, Orientalists. And he was starting. He he tried to start a lot of movements as well against the Arabic language, against because he believed that uh, the Deen was holding people back, uh, holding you know Islam in 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 Egypt was being held back by <clears throat> religion, even his own Christian religion. Right, he was against all of this. So again, like you mentioned about this whole idea of people becoming secular, postmodernism, you can see that. So Taha Hussein now. So let's go to Taha Hussein. So um, a brief biography of Taha Hussein. So I'm just going to quickly go through um, a little bit about Taha Hussein. Um, all right, so Taha Hussein is born in uh, 1889, 14th of November, comes from naturally a very big family he comes from the Saeed which is like the countryside in uh, Egypt memorized the Quran <clears throat> at a very young age he um, he lost his eyesight so he's blind um, studied in Azhar roughly around about 1902 um, he was very very um, uh, close to Muhammad Ab uh, Abdul uh, who was you know considered to be someone who was um a, a modernist yeah in his own way um later on he begins to um uh, uh you know write against him as well and rashid rada um his views started to change after sitting with muhammad abdu started to have these new types of views he actually <clears throat> left azhar uh because there was this incident took place where they realized the strange views that he had and then uh, they tested him they had like a, an interview with him and uh so he 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 basically failed in that test and they humiliated him and he felt really bad so he decided to join um al jamia al misriya al jamia al misriya so jamia al misriya was um the national um you know e egypt uh, university um this later his name changed as well right so later on it became the jamia farouk who the king farouk there was a king called king farouk mm. and the name of that changed this was roughly around about 1908. Um, now, 1910, what happened was um, Mustafa al-Manfluti, he wrote a book called Al-Nadarat. <clears throat> and um, what happened was he decided to write a rebuttal against Nadarat. So he writes uh, Nadarat fi Nadarat. Um, and then um, he also um, wrote against he wrote some like, some strange things. He wrote against Georgi Zaydan. Georgi Zaydan was a Orient, uh, a Christian Arab. Tarikh Adab al al Arabiya. Um, he also wrote against the hijab. He started to speak openly again against hijab. He he didn't. I mean, I mean, strange. He couldn't see, but he had an issue with hijab. And this is important to understand because <clears throat> Abdul Rahman Badawi he mentions. He says there were several points that the Mushrikeen uh, Orientalists were really pushing in the Muslim societies. One of them was freedom of the rights of women. Uh, for some reason, the only way that Arabs could become free was when their women were free, according to what the West understood, what freedom meant. So he began to write against hijab. Uh, hijab. <clears throat> and then he began to write articles. This is, I think, we have it different in this country uh, from, you know, like in the UK and, and in America and in the West. 
than in Egypt at that time. Egypt, um, you know, if you if you were a, a journalist in Egypt, you know, you were very influential. Uh, and this is why a lot of the so-called individuals who were influenced by Orientalists had had uh, famous articles that they used to write in various newspapers. So he wrote about politics and he wrote about uh, literature. He wrote about Islamic issues. He wrote stories. <clears throat> okay, then 1914, he got his uh, PhD. Um, and <clears throat> he went to France, 28th of May. Um, then he got delayed. He went on the 14th of November. Eventually he got there. Uh, he stayed at a friend's house and Interestingly enough, that same friend's house was he he he, he made relations with this lady, <clears throat> um, his girlfriend, uh, Suzanne. She was a Christian, and then later on he goes to marry her as well. Um, so he was being funded by the state. So the state was funding him, or the university was funding him <clears throat> to go there. And then what happened was there were some uh, problems, and then the funding stopped, and he had to come back. And he wrote like he has a book called Al Ayam, right, which is his biography. This is also another problematic book of his. In there, he writes about his, you know, this incident as well. And he was really angry about why he had to come back for. But anyway, um, one year later, 1915, he returns back to France. Uh, he goes to the, he goes to Paris and he goes to Sorbonne. Uh, he gets a PhD and he gets a PhD under a guy called Dorkheim. So Dorkheim, he is um, a Zionist. And Dorkheim was um, so, uh, a sociologist. And Dorkheim had written extensively against Ibn Khaldun. So because of that, um, he began to write against Ibn Khaldun as well. Um, and his argument, he was basically saying Ibn Khaldun's approach, um, his um, uh, his academic uh, approach in his book was uh, was outdated and it wasn't really kind of uh, honest. Um, and it was uh, filled with, um, you know, um, sort of like um, his own sort of like bias. Okay, so um, then he studied. So what he studied over there was in Paris. He studied Greek. He studied Latin, Greek history. <clears throat> he studied about Roman history. Uh, he attended uh, Dorkheim's uh, lectures, and he was highly influenced by Descartes, Descartes thinking. 1917, he gets married. <clears throat> then he does another PhD, 1918. Um, 1919, <clears throat> he returns to Egypt. He's a teacher at this um, Jami Amisriya, which is now called Jami Ahliya. Um, okay, and then uh, he, uh, he, 1923, an interesting thing happens. The Egyptian government now chooses um, Islam as its official religion. He gets extremely angry at this and he believes Islam should be separated from uh, from the state, right? So he was very secular in that. Um, just like people like Salama, Salama uh, Musa, who was a Marxist, right? So he was a Marxist. And people like Abdul Abdul Aziz Basha. Um, so he moves from. Uh, so he, he actually then, in 1925, he wrote several books. Now, so these are some of the books he writes in 1925: Qadatul Fikr, Manaratul Islam, and Hadithul Arbi'a, which is a weekly Wednesday article he used to write in the newspaper. Uh, and he writes about Falsafa Ibn Khaldun. Um, now he he moves. <coughs> He moves from the Department of History, because that's his speciality, to the Department of Arabic Language. Now, one interesting thing is this. Um, this is what uh, Anwar al-Jundi al mentions, and this is also, um, um, you know, Shakir mentions as well. He says, um, he says, Taha uh, Hussein said, I learned, he says, I learned the Quran better in France than I learned it in, from the scholars of Azhar. And he learned the Quran in France from a guy called uh, Casanova, Paul Casanova. And Paul Casanova, again, he was Orientalist and, and obviously he believed the Quran was not from Allah and it was an endeavor of the Prophet ﷺ and it was filled with errors. And But he was in, in, in impressed by that. Um, okay, then 1926 is where he writes the Fishir al Jahili. And this actually causes some people, some academics to support him in this, and many others um, got really upset at him, and they they, they wrote against him. Um, one of the things that he's criticized for is um, something that Margaluth said. I don't know, is it, do you spell it? How do you pronounce it? Margoliath? Oh, I'm not sure, I forgot. <laughs> 
I don't know how to. Well, I know who you're talking about. I, I, I've yeah. always saw the the name, but I never figured out. Okay. Yeah. So D. S. Margulis, David Samuel Margulis. So Margulis, he he has this <clears throat> claim, which he says basically, Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam were were fictional characters in the Quran. They were made up. Um. So many people that were close to Taha Hussein said that he also believed that as well. He believed this was. Um, in the Quran, it's there. In the religious texts, it's there. Semitic texts, it's there. But it's historically can't be proven. <clears throat> and this is where he starts his critique of Jahili poetry. <clears throat> so what happens? Protests start against him. In naturally, there's a lot of you know, Orthodox Muslims in Egypt. A lot of students now walk out from his lessons. Um, you know, protests against him. Some people went far enough to even threaten him that they're gonna kill him. Um, he was told to go abroad. So now he's gone abroad. And in 1927, he rewrites his Fish al Arabi. He rewrites and he calls it Fil Adab al Arabi. And he takes out a lot of the controversial things, but there's still a lot of other things left in there. So he tries to kind of water it down. Um, now, in this time, in this time, um, when he comes back to Egypt, he supervises the PhD of a guy um, called Israel uh, Wilfinson. Right, so Israel Wilfinson he writes a book. He's a Jewish uh, Zionist. He later on becomes one of the fathers of of Israel. <laughs> he writes a book called Tariq al Yahud fi Bilad al Arab. Now, why is this book important? This book is important. Anwar Jundi says is because um, Taha Hussein believes that um, Judaism influenced a lot of Islam. So basically, a lot of what you get in the Quran, a lot of what you get from Arabic poetry. Is um, is simply borrowed from Judaism. Yeah, it's from 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 their works. And this guy was actually this Jewish guy was actually the first PhD um, um, graduate from this university. Um, later on, the same guy, the same individual, he changes his name, um, and he writes a book. Um, and, and I think it's in Germany. He gets a PhD for it as well. Ka'ab al Ahbar wa Asruhu fil Qasas al Hadith wal Qasas al Islamia. So famous um, Tabi'i, Ka'abul Ahbar, and his influence in uh, you know historical stories and uh, Islamic stories as well, right? So again, you can tell that there's some sort of an issue there. Um, so what happens now is, so now you know things calm down. One of the things that Taha Hussein was famous for saying was, uh, Egyptian people are are sleepy people. They'll make a lot of noise, and then after a while, they'll calm down and forget everything happened. Right, this was something that you know angered a lot of people, uh, academics later on as well. Um, okay, now, uh, so what happened was, um, protests happened, and the decision was passed. Uh, so, so, so many of the Muslims took this to court now because they wanted to prove that he was blaspheming uh, the Muslims with this book. The courts, in fact, overturned the, the ruling and said that it's not blasphemy. Uh, it's just uh, he used um, words that he could have um, he, he he could have used and he could have he could have chosen better words to use in his book. Sur um, ikhtiyar al alfaz. That's what this is. He didn't articulate himself properly. Uh, articulate. Yeah. That's it. Articulate. Um, um, uh, I think you know, was all this happening under Jamal Abdul Nasser? No, no, no. Before this. This is before. Okay. Yeah, this was all before. Okay. Yeah, this is the revolution happened in 1952. Mm. That's when Jamal Abdel Nasir and everything happened mm. after that. But before this, you had this monarchy. Mm. Okay, so now what happens is he's become professor of adab now. Strange, he's become professor of adab. And he was told to resign. So people, you know, interceded with the highest authorities. and said, look, this guy, this guy basically, you know, he's he's written these books. How can he be the professor of adab when he doesn't believe the adab is preserved? So he was forced to resign. And then he had a condition. He goes, let me become the professor let me gain that status, that position, and then let me resign. So anyway, he does that. 1929, he starts writing his Al Ayyam, which is his his autobiography. 1933, Syrian protests start now. So, in Syria, you know, his book now starts spreading there, and um, people begin to burn his books in Syria. Lots of Syrian students. 1933, and he writes some books in 1933, Dua Al Karawan. One of his books that he writes. Uh, 1935, um, 
he writes a book called Adib, and he writes another book which is controversial, Ma Abil Ala Fi Sijnihi. Abil Ala Al Ma'arri was was a controversial individual in certain things that he wrote, especially like uh, Risalatul Wufran. Um, um, so he was kind of comparing himself with um, the, the 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 tribulations that Ma, uh, uh, Abil Ala was going through. Okay, 1936, uh, he's elected again. <clears throat> he's re-elected as the uh, rector of uh, of language studies. Um, and he writes uh, a book called Min Hadith, a Shi'r, wa Nathra. So he writes some literature. Now, <clears throat> he's... Um, um, 1937, is he writes a book called Al Qasr Al Mas'hur Ma Al Mutanabi. Um, and then, what strange thing seems to happen now is so obviously people are writing against him. So in 1937, he writes a book which is on a totally different topic, which is Sira book called Ala Hamish Sira. But still, in even in that Sira book, <clears throat> he's mentioned certain things which are controversial as well. So he still has that sort of like issue, the Orientalist ideas. Um, 1938, he writes a book that makes him quite popular in, in Egypt. Mustaqbil al-Thaqafa fi Misr. Yeah, the future of the culture of myth, myth, of, of Egypt, site of Egypt. Uh, Thaqafa would be culture, wouldn't it? Yeah. Or would they be? Okay. Yeah. Okay, now 1938, 1939. So fourth time he's elected as the, the head of, of language studies department. Right, so he, he's, he's having an influence on a lot of students. <clears throat> okay, he establishes 1942 Jami al-Iskandariya. So in Alexandria, establish a, a, a university. Now, we have to understand when he establishes university, what, what are his aims and objectives? <clears throat> his aims and objectives are he wants a university that's free-thinking university. And he wants men and women to be able to mix with each other. He somehow believes allowing men and women to mix with each other and having no restrictions will give them freedom. Um, so he's criticized there. 1944, he's actually made to retire. And he says, this is what he says, <clears throat> from 1945 to 1950 were the hardest years of his life. This was the most difficult time of his life that he was going through. 1950, uh, the Jami al Misriya has changed his name again because of the King Farouk to Jami al Farouk. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry, interrupt you, Sheikh. Uh, is there a reason why those were the. Because the... he basically couldn't, had no influence, couldn't do anything? Uh -huh. No, no teaching, no lectures, no. And I think that's important in today's times. Social media has now provided that platform for the person who could have, who would not have been heard if it wasn't for social social media. Um, okay. Then what happened was 1952 revolution takes place, right? So the monarchy is uh, ends, um, and this is where Jamal Abdul Nasir comes in. Okay, he actually attends for the first time in 1955. He attends Ijtima' al-Lujna uh, uh, al uh, 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 al uh, So he attends this big sort of like uh, symposium mm -hmm. of uh, Arabic culture and language in Jeddah. So Saudi Arabia now. So Saudi Arabia has now given him position. No one in Saudi Arabia, this is what uh, Anwar Judi says, no one in Saudi Arabia attended his, um, his, his, his talks except for um, al Sha'arawi, Sheikh Sha'arawi. Sha'arawi was there in Saudi Arabia and Sha'arawi had heard good things about him and maybe Sha'arawi wasn't aware of everything about him and Sha'arawi attended his uh, and, and spoke highly of him this is the only individual which is strange because Sheikh Sha'arawi was uh, Egyptian so um, yeah. you, you'd figure that he knew about now him. <laughs> I came across something which was the reason maybe was because I think he tried to change his image Taha Hussein that sometimes what happens is an individual might come out with very controversial views, mm. realize that, you know what, people are now attacking too much and it's time to, you know, um, repackage yourself. Mm. So now he's repackaged and written the Sira book. And he's also now <clears throat> visited Jeddah. He went to visit the Prophet Sallallahu grave as well. Mm. He went to Medina um, and he went to Mecca. He, he, he did Umrah there as well. So maybe people thought, you know what, this guy is changing now and he's coming towards... Uh, Jamal Abdul Nasir in 1958 uh, awarded him with Qalada um, to Neil. That's some sort of a, a pendant, the, some award that he was given. Uh, um, and then 1963, he was the head of Majma al Lugha al Misri for 1963 and in 1960, up to 1967. Um, and then 1973 is when he died. 
that's basically about his life. Um, you know, some mm. some interesting things about his life. Mm. Okay, now when it comes to when it comes to um, um, the book that he wrote, so f- <clears throat> the book that he wrote, Fish Al Jahili. This is one of the controversial books, um, and uh, Al Ayyam is a controversial book. And Hadith Al Arabiya has some controversial things in there as well. If anyone's interested in reading about that, I would definitely recommend reading these three books. Fish Al Jahili. I probably like read this and listened to this maybe three or four times cover to cover because I wanted to understand like was he really saying what, what he was saying because there were some really strange things in there and then um, you know um, like I'm going to mention later on some of the works that were then against the, the, the book one of the, the works that I found really beneficial was uh, Al-Naqd Shir Al-Jahili uh, by uh, Muhammad uh, Al-Khidr Al- 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 um, so Controversial works by him, Shir al Jahili. What kind of issues? So, all the issues that he mentioned can be uh, summed up into three, uh, into three points, three major points. One was who are the Arabs? One was what is the truth of their language, the history of their language, and what is the history of the Arabs? I think those are the three main points you can put everything under. And this is this is all Orientalism speaking here, all from Orientalists. And the reason we know this is because. When it came to the claims that he made, <clears throat> for example, like um, Jahili poetry doesn't portray a true picture of what was at the time of pre-Islamic era. So pre-Islamic era, he believes that the Quran image that's that, that that's that's uh, presented about Jahiliya is the most accurate image that you can have, and anything that does not fit up to this image is wrong. That's what he claims. So he says, for example, like. He says religious uh, lifestyle. <clears throat> we believe that the the mushriks, people prior to Islam, predominantly were 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 polytheists. We we hardly find any polytheism, uh, a widespread polytheism in their poetry. Why is that? Uh, number two, intellectual life as well. So the Quran mentions about um, the mushriks being very very uh, strong in being able to argue. They're very argumentative people. So why don't we find that in their poetry? Uh, political as well. So politically, <clears throat> these were individuals. The Quran mentions Rihlat al Shita, it was safe. Yeah, and mentions about their connections with with uh, other other foreign nations. How come their poetry doesn't mention that? Economic as well. Um, so economically, again, the, the Rihla and all that. Social as well. So they had a very deep social um, you know, uh, practices. How come that wasn't mentioned in their poetry? A uh, different language. So the, the argument we mentioned earlier on that the Arabs living near the north, their Arabic was different from the Arabs living in the south. How comes we don't see that in the poetry? All poetry is ubiquitous. It's all the same. You find the same standard style of, of language, even the grammar, even you know the, the, the types of expressions that they, they use. And the different dialects as well isn't seen in the poetry. Okay, so... No strong chain for poetry. This is another argument that he raises. <clears throat> he basically says <clears throat> that <clears throat> uh, there isn't strong chain of poetry. What does that mean? He means that there's. He claims that there's only two individuals that were the main conduits for passing Arabic poetry. The Rawis, uh, a guy called Hamad uh, Al Rawiya, and another guy called uh, Khalaf Al Ahmar. And these two, he claims, these two were. Were immoral individuals, really bad, news, and they were known for lying as well, right? They were you drink wine, and they would flirt with women, and, and um, they were known for lying and 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 making up plagiarizing uh, poetry. So uh, he he's claiming that these two individuals transmitted the bulk of pre that's it of jahili po- poetry. Yeah, that's that's what he claims, and he's getting now. This is the interesting thing. Where is he getting this from? Why is he saying this for? So. We're going to hopefully look at that, inshallah, when we try to respond. Okay, the meanings of the Quranic words were in the hands of later people. This is another problematic issue. He believes that later people now were almost, like you were saying, you know, deconstructing. They were dictating of what the word meant in the Quran. And who invented what they... And they these were individuals who would invent whatever meaning they wanted to invent. By basically... They, they, he One of his things is, he says... How is it so easy for the Mufassirin to find a poem for every word? This was one of his things. How is it so easy for, for them to do so? And he says, it should be very difficult. 
Okay, Imru al Qais, he believes a lot of these Jahili poets were basically uh, uh, fi fictional characters. They were. Mm -hmm. Imru al Qais was a fictional character based upon um, a Greek. Um, a Greek individual. So there was like this historic individual uh, that Greek philosophy talks about, or Greek history talks about, uh, who traveled the world and he met all these people and he came out with his poetry and he was in love with women. And he just basically said, Arabs heard that story and they've come out with their own version of it. Um, Banu Umayyah's era, he believes Banu Umayyah were, were, were chiefly responsible for inventing poetry. Right for a whole list of reasons. Uh, Quran being influenced by poets such as Umayyah ibn Abi Salt, and this is dangerous. This is this is like so dangerous, because Umayyah ibn Abi Salt, he was a contemporary of the Prophet Sallam, or slightly before. He didn't accept Islam, <clears throat> but the Prophet Sallam used to like listening to the poetry of Umayyah ibn Salt. This is found in Hadith, and sometimes people would read. You know, some of the narrators would say we would read dozens of couplets of Umayyah ibn Abi Salt. And the Prophet Sallallahu would enjoy listening. And they were filled with like Tawheed, oneness of Allah, even though the individual hadn't embraced Islam. <clears throat> so he says, what was happening was, Quran was being influenced by the, the words of Umayyad ibn Abi Salt. Now that's, you can almost look at that, I don't know if he meant that really, but you can almost look at that as saying that the Muslims were taking ideas from poetry and they were superimposing them onto Quran. Um, and this is, you know, very dangerous again. And finally, a doubt in historical existence of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam. Right? These two individuals, did they really exist or not? Because what he says in his book, he lays it out very clear in his book. He says, he says, I wish that Muslims from day one would have investigated and thoroughly researched all of their sciences, all of their their, their works, like uh, like Descartes would have. Basically, his idea is you separate religion, you separate your emotions, put it all to one side, and impartially you look at all the information. And then whatever conclusion you come to, that's basically what you believe. Right. So it sounds sounds honest, it sounds like you know, sounds like a sincere guy. But the problem with that is that's like saying only my way, only my approach in in in, in understanding academic. Um, you know, literature is uh, the superior way, is the best way, and every other way historically, whatever society is, are all inferior and filled with flaws, right? And and again, this is a problem. Why do you make this individual? And is does he live up to this? Does he really um, implement Descartes' um, philosophy throughout his book? That's another problem. Now, um, uh, these are just some of the the the, the, the issues that he raised. Um, there's so many, and again, if you want to really go through all of them, these are the six books. Uh, six books that um, that the scholars uh, that that will that will really sort of like um, answer all the problematic issues that not only he but also people that came before him had raised against um, Quran, uh, Arabic language, Hadith as well. So um, just some of these I just mentioned. Mustafa al-Rafi'i. So Tahta Rayat al-Quran. So Tahta Rayat al-Quran is it was basically um, articles that were written in the newspaper as well, and it's not really dissecting the work of Fishir al-Jahili. It's more like giving context. It's more like um, explaining things and making sense of really concepts that he was coming out with. Um, so that's a really good book. It's, it's a bit hard to understand because you have to read Fishir al-Jahili first. In order to understand what he's saying, Muhammad Al Khudari, he has Muhadarat fi Bayan al Al Akhta Al Ilmiya wa Tarikhiya al Ati Ishtamalat Alayh Al Kitab fi Shayr Al Jahili. Okay, so again, he's kind of dissected it, he's gone through. Now, because he was more of an Usuli scholar, Usul, he's kind of used Usul to kind of approach this. Al Khidr Hussein, Muhammad Al Khidr Hussein, Naqd Al Naqd, with the Dad Naqd Kitab fi Shayr Al Jahili. Okay, so again, he is an amazing book that he's written. Um, because if you read it, you'll see how much, just like Pete individual Mustafa Sabri had such a vast understanding of uh, Orientalists, he has also a vast understanding of Orientalists as well. Uh, so his work is a very good work to read as well. Uh, breaks down every argument of his line by line, you know, each line by line. So it's, it's, it's quite a long read. Muhammad Farid al Wajdi, who was another uh, journalist at his time. Um, uh, and he wrote Naqad with Adal Naqad Kitab 
الشعر الجاهلي um i didn't i didn't manage to read all this book um i just like looked at sections of it so um i can't really comment too much muhammad juma al shihab al ras again i didn't read this book in detail um but i just looked at a few sections muhammad ahmed al ghamrawi so muhammad ahmed al ghamrawi he wrote a book called naqd al tahlili li kitab fi al adab al jahili so he was a he was a tabi'i so i think a tabi'i is a what's that is that someone who's a Naturally scientist, yeah, someone oh, to the okay. natural sciences. Mm-hmm. So he approaches he approaches the response not from like an like like like, like a classical Torah sort of like literature. He approaches it from analyzing was he honest in in breaking down or 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 uh, or, or presenting his arguments how Descartes would have in the Descartes philosophy was mm-hmm. was he honest in that and he, or was he not? And he really does a good job. Like he breaks it down, he shows that he was really just um, just parroting um, Marjolut and these guys, yeah. So he was just really doing that. Okay, so these are the books I would definitely recommend. Um, now I just want to mention to you some of the arguments now, um, and then and then and, that's and, it. And, and, it's, and it's good. So this to is see, the last slide. And it's good to see that the responses came from uh, individuals with from different angles and different. Levels of specialization. Yeah, so it seems like a, a, a multi-pronged uh, counter-attack, so to speak. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Now, uh, I mean, not all the attacks would be um, would be at the same level. Like some of them, when I read them, you could feel that a lot of people were taking taking certain things very emotionally, and and that it's understandable. You know, you've got an individual who's looked up to in the community. The government has given a very high position, and um, he, you know. He's saying things which are literally attacking the core of Islam. So people would take that personally. But I think people have to understand when you're reading something like this, you have to understand the historic impact he was having on the Muslims, mm-hmm. average Muslim, and why people were responding in different ways. Mm-hmm. Like um, I didn't mention it here, but uh, Mahmoud Shakir, his response uh, is is a very good response. It's, it's a different response. It's like a student response. Like like he's really upset with his teacher of how he's how he's discussed these things. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to mention uh, just certain points here, and then I think the maybe answer the the questions. Um, so <clears throat> this is um, <clears throat> now Sheikh Ahmed Shakir. By the way, uh, I mentioned to you he had a book called Ashar or Lugha. So I would definitely recommend people to read his book Ashar <clears throat> Lugha. He also has a book called Tashi Tashi Al Kutub. Tashih al-Kutub wa sun'u al-Faharis. Tashih al-Kutub wa sun'u al-Faharis al-Mu'jama wa kaifiyatu dabt al-Kitabi wa sabq al-Muslimin al-Ifringe fi thalika. Yeah, so it's a very long title. And I think these guys in the past used to enjoy having like three line titles. But the, the, the gist of the book is this. He saw that people were becoming influenced by Orientalism to such a degree that they thought Orientalists um, have tackled Islam better than classical Muslims could have ever done so. And that what the Orientalists have provided to the world today is something which is um, unprecedented. So what he does is he looks through the entire history of Muslims and he brings together all of the academic, so like prowess and um, academic works that the scholars had produced in the past that were far, far greater than anything that the Orientalists has produced. Yeah, and this is a this is a work I would definitely recommend anyone who is you know who who is into um, this kind of su- subject to look into. Okay. Um, okay. So. Okay. So this is, if you want to find like a summary, if you want to find a really nice summary that someone has done, I would definitely recommend this book. Um, it's called Ashahid al Shi'ri. في تفسير القرآن الكريم يا أشاهد الشعري أشاهد الشعري في تفسير القرآن الكريم أهميته وأثره مناهج المفسرين في الاستشهاد به This was a PhD that was written by Dr. Abdul Rahman uh, Shahri So Abdul Rahman Shahri um, in Saudi Arabia he wrote this and I think I, I personally think that this is probably one of the most important works to first of all understand how important poetry was to classical Muslims and he's done a very good job on this and then he's got a chapter on there which tackles Orientalism and Taha Hussein. 
and he's the one that sort of like summarizes this so instead of me going through all of that i just thought you know i just present what he he so some of the major points that he mentions so for example like i'll give you an example what he does in his book is he he brings um he shows classically how the scholars would do istish istishhad al lughawiya right so from a linguistic point of view how early scholars uh, have used words in their works yeah so for example fi bayani ma'anin mufradat in simply just explaining what each word means mm. um and tafriq bayna ma'ani mushtaraka so words that were almost you can say um you know um, homonyms mm. how he separates between them um al bayan ishtiqaq al mufradat even to break down the individual letters and and what the original sources um sigha the the the, the sigha the form format of the word bayan al lugha al fasiha fi al so even you have one word, but you can have various words, and one is fasih and one is afsah. So he breaks that down as well. He shows how the early scholars looked into this. Istishhad um, lima la qiraatan. So certain istishhad that would be used as a lugha but not in qiraa. Hmm. He also goes into bayan wurud al lafda fil lugha, and then he goes into so many other things. So I think that that section, chapter that he does is very good. Okay, the one that I want to mention is. Uh, Okay, so one of the things that he argues, which also, which also, um, Muhammad Shakir argues as well. Muhammad Shakir, Mahmoud Shakir, he says, um, what Daha Hussein has done is nothing new. He says what's happened is historically um, there was an individual by the name of now again, you gotta um, forgive me for not pronouncing this properly, Theodore Noldeke. Is it Noldeke? I don't know. Yeah, so Theodore uh, Noldek. Yeah, Theodore Noldek. Yeah, Noldek. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just saying Noldek. Noldek. Yeah. Noldek. So Theodore Noldek, he was one of the first to now start speaking about the Quran. Mm. Yeah. He didn't speak against the Quran as much as Margalut Mar Mar did, but he did speak a lot against it. So he almost, you could say, he he wrote one of the, the first works on, on this. Then after him, uh, another individual who came after him, who did a lot of work was uh Carl Brockelman. So Carl Brockelman as well, he was someone who actually wrote a whole fahadis of the other works as well. But at the same time, he also mentioned certain criticisms of of uh, Sher al Jahili as well. Um and then you have um individuals like um uh Clement Huot again and I'm not saying that name properly and then you had you had uh David Samuel Margulis. Yeah, so David Samuel Margulis then he wrote his um article, which was about the um classical Arabic literature in 1925, interestingly, one year before, one year before Fishir al Jahili. So Ta Hussein must have been aware of Margulis' works. But <clears throat> after Margulis, the person who really <coughs> Mar Margulis he started to cast doubts. He started to tashkik, cast doubts into um, this whole Quran being being um, preserved, or as in the words being preserved, jahili, uh, whether it was made up. Um, and then Shah that came after him, Joseph Shah. Joseph Shah is probably the one who really, <clears throat> who really now becomes the standard now for later Orientalists. That he blatantly says that. Majority. So Margulis actually said about um, hadith as well. He said uh, it seems as though a lot of the database of hadith that we have uh, is made up by early Muslims uh, just to strengthen their own uh, religion. Um, and uh, and then Shaht comes along and says, no, a hundred percent they made it up. Right? All these individuals they just made it up. Now, if you're going to follow someone who writes like this, then clearly, um, you know, and, and not criticize them, then clearly this is problematic as a Muslim. So some of them even said, some of them said this, that, um, that, 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 the, that what the Muslims have done, he says, Al -fiqhu fi This is what some of the orientals, early, early, early orientals were saying, that Islamic fiqh is simply just a copy paste from early uh, Greek or Roman um, law. Yeah, so uh, you know, Justinian apparently is was a Roman leader 
who laid down the laws of 457 BC. Um, and some some of the Orientists even went far to say that fiqh is is, is simply just um, you know um, a carbon copy of the Talmud. That's what it is. Um, so so this is why when it comes to when it comes to what we were saying about the Descartes, the the approach that that Descartes approach that he was taking, Taha Hussein was taking. One of the main problems was number one, he wasn't understanding. Like at least if someone understands what Descartes was saying. It makes sense, but it seems as though if you read his works, he wasn't understanding what Descartes was saying. He uses a lot of his own personal emotions, personal sort of like joining the dots together of a way of coming to a conclusion. Number two, he clearly goes against a lot of the of the, 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 the of what he said about Descartes. So again, you know, Mukhalafa is doing a lot of sort of uh, contradiction to him saying that I'm going to put all of my desires to a side and religion to a side. I'm going to simply follow what the facts say. Uh, many examples of, of 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 where he actually goes against that. <clears throat> um, number three is evidences that he uses. So what he seems to do a lot is he says this a lot in his book. <laughs> he seems to indicate as as though this is a proof. Like he's saying things like, you know, well then, what what's to say that the Muslim didn't make it up? Like how can you go from saying that uh, Hamad al Rawiya or, you know, Khalif uh, al-Ahmar were liars and this and that and that. What's to say that the other Arabs didn't make it up? Yeah. So how can you reach that conclusion? So, you know, problematic. Number four, uh, he, he he clearly has an agenda of trying to um, create shak, doubt about the uh, uh, words of some of, the, some of the words in the Quran. Um, and um, number, so, so for example, like, um, so like when we said before about Umay ibn Salt, Abi Salt, yeah, that he's saying a lot of what was in the Quran was borrowed from Umay ibn Abi Salt or people later on, uh, Abbasis. Uh, number five, uh, there's clear contradictions and um, in what he says. Um, um, okay, I just wanted to find an example of okay, um, and just do one more one more argument. Um, now, one of the things that he argues is Sher al-Jahili does not uh, represent accurately uh, the Jahili religion that existed. He doesn't represent it. Uh, and this is false, simply because people that were very close to Taha Hussein, <clears throat> this is something I read in some articles um, that were written by uh, Egyptians that were at his time. And they said people that were very close to Taha Hussein, they said that he wouldn't read a book because he was blind. People would read it for him. And he would... Two things that he failed to do. Number one, he hardly read a full book. He would read certain sections. Number two is that <laughs> a, lot, a lot of his sources were secondhand. So he wouldn't read the Arabic. He would read <coughs> the French. And then what he would do is he would Arabize it. And he made lots of mistakes in this as well. Because like when the French try to you know um, give a particular word, a French, I don't know what it's called. Yeah, I mean, they'll uh, translate the Arabic you know, into Latin. a French. Yeah, yeah, French version of it, yeah? Mm. So when they try to Latinize it, what he would try to, from that Latin pronunciation of it, he would try to come out with the Arabic and he'd make mistakes. And clearly you can tell he hasn't gone back to the original source. He simply purely relied. And where's the Descartes, like where's the Descartes, uh, you know, uh, investigation and honesty in there? Mm. Um, so again, uh, he, one of the things that he does is... Um, he is very, very uh, exaggerating in his work. Like he, he, he does a lot of exaggeration and, um, I don't know, what's the word for it? Hyperbole. He uses a lot, mm. right? In the way he says things, like he says, vast majority of the works were poetry mm. was made up by the Abbasids. Mm. Now, when you go to investigate all of this, you can't prove it. Mm. Yeah. So again, where does he get all this from? Again, it's from, you know, his teachers um, in France. It's from it's the people that he looks up to. Mm. Um, and Dr. Shahri has done a very good job. I mean, he has actually gone through early tafsirs and he's found he's found many examples where the Mufassirin have uh, Tabari. So, for instance, like he says, uh, Tabari has quoted from 150 or so poets. Um, <clears throat> some of them were known and some of them were unknown. Uh, let me find. Uh, let me find what he says. Yeah, he says, look, he says this, he says, 
This is what Dr. Shahri says. He says, <clears throat> Qurtubi has, has, has mentioned 4,807 uh, shawahid shi'riya uh, in his tafsir. Right? This is Qurtubi. Yeah? And then he says, uh, Tabari has, has mentioned uh, 2,260 2260, um, istishad poems as evidence for, for, for language in his Tafsir Tabari, which is one of the earliest works. And then he goes through each one, Ibn Atiyah and Zamakhshari mm -hmm. <coughs> from the earliest works. <coughs> and then he says, he says, for example, like uh, Tabari has relied upon 122 known Jahili poets mm -hmm. and 310 unknown Jahili poets. So that mm -hmm. shows, um, you know, people like Taha Hussein were unaware of these or either they were just ignorant of them. They were looking at them. They didn't mention them. If you want to be honest in your, you have to at least go through these. You have to mention these to the to the audience. Um, and then he goes through many others. Well, I'm, sure, you know, that, I'm sure as a as a blind person, he's not he's not going to find someone to read <laughs> all of the tabari to him, you know, and uh, capture all yeah, these things. I mean, yeah. And, and maybe that's the reason why Ahmed, Mahmoud Shakir with his brother, they edited uh, Tafsir Tabari. Maybe, uh -huh. I mean, I don't know. Because they wanted to see like, is it true that the early scholars were were were, were unaware of of the so-called um, plagiarism or or invention that they were coming out with? Yeah, um, yeah and that's it basically. So that's that's the end of the conclusion. So the impact of Western Orientalism on Muslims, generally, I would say, because we're living in the West, um, we clearly um, um, can't avoid. Many of us can't avoid uh, Orientalist works, right? Many uh, are working in the academic fields mm. and have to engage with these texts. And just like I mentioned in the beginning, um, <clears throat> the statement of Abdul Rahman al Badawi, where he mentioned that you know we have to prepare for 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 the inevitable um, when the Orientalists are writing. So I think there is definitely going to be an impact of Orientalism on the Muslims, the way we think, the way we see things, the way we read things. But at the same time, I think it just it just means we've just got to work a bit more harder <clears throat> to try and um, to try and present. The arguments um, for, from a traditional point of view, and to show that Orientalism isn't anything which is new. The same arguments that they're using, these people are using, are simply arguments that were borrowed from before. In fact, um, this is what Abdul Rahman Al Badawi, one of his um, one of his um, sort of like um, uh, complaints that he makes about this whole discussion. He says, "Why is it that the Egyptians or the scholars they they um, started to?" Um, uh, right against Taha Hussein so late even though they knew <clears throat> Noldak was one of the first to write about this and even before Noldak, Muslim um, Muhammad ibn Salam al-Jumahi, who is one of the earliest scholars known for linguists he is one of the first to say that um, a lot of the poetry, a lot of the poetry not all of it, not most of it, but a lot of the poetry in the early years was <clears throat> was manhul yeah, was made up yeah, it was plagiarized. Now, clearly, if a person wanted to do an honest research for this, they would simply go back to what the early scholars had said and find out why Muhammad ibn Salam al Jumahi was saying this and understand that scholars didn't have a problem with that. They knew that there was a vast amount of poetry that was uh, that was uh, that was plagiarized. Uh, uh, Mahmoud Shakir himself says this as well, <clears throat> but to to create like um, this whole sort of like. Um, issue now about this because Taha Hussein said this he says this was unfair it should have been done before and at least Muslims should have been prepared for this so 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 again you know I think um, we shouldn't I, I personally think we shouldn't react too much to when Orientalists say something because it doesn't mean anything to us it shouldn't mean anything to us when we should react is when it's something which Muslims individuals say Taha Hussein and these individuals and understand where he's coming from <clears throat> is Orientalism and we're okay that's fine that's him He's got nothing to do with the classical Islamic heritage. <clears throat> That's the first thing. Second is, the last thing, the need for strong, robust research uh, to preserve Islam and the Quran. This is, I think, I see this, I, 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 I'm I, a full-time teacher and um, I see this on a day-to-day -day basis. Th there's like a decline now <clears throat> in Muslims wanting to study Islam thoroughly and from a really traditional point of view. Academia is very sort of like attractive to people because you get the qualification, you get the <clears throat> sort of like access to to various circles. Uh, but I think Muslims should understand that you need to have a solid grounding in 
uh, Arabic language, Quran, Tafsir, Hadith, whatever science you want to go into, have a, th- a classical understanding of it thorough and encourage people, youngsters and the future generations to actually invest their, their selves into this, these fields. And then if you want to go into academia, Alhamdulillah, go into it. <clears throat> like people like Alhamdulillah, Mustafa uh, A'zami, Sheikh Mustafa A'zami, who, you know, who did a very good job in dismantling Orientalism um, and uh, understanding where they actually come from so that it makes it easier for us to be able to work uh, and develop that as well. Uh, on that, inshallah. Um, Barakallahu feekum, Sheikh. Um, you know, this is a very, very educational and uh, original topic that you have explored for us here today. You know, and uh, uh, it really makes us appreciate the the blessing of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for uh, enabling the efforts of our scholars to preserve our deen, and that we shouldn't take these things for granted and recognize that we stand on the on the shoulders of these great giants. You know doing all these tafasir, doing all these dictionaries and, uh, uh, you know, just preserving the language. Uh, you know, uh, th- these are these are great blessings that uh, Allah has given this ummah. And uh, we um, sometimes or many times we we fail to take heed of that and uh, and remember that. Um, you know, and uh, before I let you go, uh, uh, you know, you, you did speak a lot about uh, Islamic poetry. And uh, I believe on your YouTube channel, Roots of Knowledge, you teach Muslims about some, you know, some of these poems. You know, can you tell us? Can you tell us about that and how Muslims can benefit from from your from your lessons and your material? Jazakallah uh, khair. Um, Allah bless you, brother. And um, you know, I, I I actually got interested in um, um, your YouTube channel as well, and I would definitely recommend. Uh, to my viewers as well, subscribers, to definitely check out your content as well. It's really beneficial. It's not just, um, I mean, I always tell, <clears throat> sorry, this is before to answer your question here. Yeah? I just want okay. to mention this before I forget. Um, I think it's it's very important to understand um, we can't disengage ourselves from social media and from providing content in a, in a new platform. Mm. Um, it might be something alien to a lot of people. Uh, of why is it that Muslim traditionalists um, are trying to um, make these videos and you know, presented in this fashion. What we have to understand is, although a lot of the content is geared towards a certain audience, um, we have to show the vast majority of people out there that this is what we need to work towards. And the content that you're providing, alhamdulillah, I think it's it's very, very beneficial for a lot of people who unfortunately, like you mentioned in the beginning of the of the, of the the presentation, you mentioned about certain uh, Muslim um, um, individuals out of the academic uh, individuals out there who maybe not want, even though they specialize in a certain field, they don't want to talk about certain issues um, because they feel that it's just fanning the flames and it's just, you know, causing people to 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 have more doubts about a certain issue. Um, but I think at the same time, when, when when a problem is, you know, let out the can and now you can't put it back in again, um, there has to be organizations and platforms like what you guys are providing uh, to do a great job on that. So may Allah bless you guys. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate um, um, as for the, the content that I make uh, I mean my content is just purely Just for just people who just want to learn The Arabic language, that's the main thing that I want to do um, I, I initially Started the the, the YouTube channel um, Just to help students supplement Their, their studying at madrasas And universities who may have um, Not really kind of Covered all the gaps in their education And I thought I'd do it systematically And with recordings, you know, you're not in front of a teacher You don't feel shy, you can play it back Multiple times and make as much notes as you can, as you want. So um, one of the areas that I really wanted to focus on was Arabic um, literature, especially Arabic poetry, uh, Adab al-Arabi, uh, simply because I haven't found anything um, on social media <clears throat> which covers this. And this was one of the reasons, Taha Hussein was one of the reasons for why I, I actually wanted to provide this, um, this information for people out there. I personally believe that um, as a Muslim, um, in whatever way you can, you should try to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but you should also do it in a way which is um, which is uh, digestible as well. Uh, in a way that's easy for people to access as well. And also, it doesn't cause confusion for people as well. Uh, so this is why on my YouTube channel, I have poetry on there. Uh, Imam Shafi, rahimullah's poetry. I went through uh, many of his poems in some of the books that I attribute to him. Currently, I'm going through the poetry of uh, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. Again, a lot of the poems are not his poems. Uh, we can't really trace them back to him. 
But many people have attributed them to him and they're nice poems. They have some really good words in their vocab for anyone who wants to learn as well. Um, and to get uh, to get themselves from one, uh, you know, one sort of like level of understanding the Arabic language uh, to be able to understand uh, classical poetry. I think that's what we, where, where we, all students want to really go to be able to appreciate the Quran. Um, and inshallah, if that's achievable, if a person can really understand the Quran as close as how the Sahaba understood the Quran, then inshallah, we've achieved our uh, our, our objective, inshallah. Mashallah. Barakallahu feekum, Sheikh, for all your efforts. And I, you know, I do, I do strongly want to recommend to to our listeners to please check out uh, Mufti Liaqat's uh, channel, Roots of Knowledge. Um, I was highly impressed with it when I came across it a few years ago. Uh, you know, Mufti's uh, teaching style is definitely unique. Uh, uh, you know, I, lo I love the I love the illustrations. I love the clarity. I love the, you know going straight to the point, not not belabouring and taking too long to to you know to give and in, in terms of giving unnecessary details. You get straight to the point, explain it quickly, clearly. And, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, a lot of people who want to advance in, in, in their Arabic studies will benefit very greatly from your channel. And uh, thank you once again for being a guest on Blogging Theology. <laughs> Greatly <laughs> benefited <laughs> from this pres uh, presentation, and I'm sure our listeners will agree. Um, any final words, uh, Mufti, before we bring this session to a close? Um, uh, I mean, all I would say is just to, to general anyone that's watching these types of videos, uh, I think... It, it's very important for Muslims um, to not be <clears throat> naive when it comes to um, anything that people say on social media. It's very easy just to be um, misled by how a person appears and maybe the name that they have uh, to think that they're always um, sincere and correct in in what they're trying to do. Always, um, you know, always search for the truth. Uh, try to um, stay in the company of good people, people who you know. In, in, in the real world rather than just in the virtual world. Uh, people that you're, that, you know, honest people, sadiqeen, inshallah. Uh, excellent message uh, to end with. And in light of that, I would like to part you and our listeners with the Islamic readings of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.